Hello, glad to see you on my channel. I really value it. And today I want to share with you a wonderful story. It's a dramatic story that will come as a total shock to everybody. It is a really amazing story. So enjoy watching it. Elizabeth returned home after university as usual. Entering the apartment, the girl immediately realized that something was wrong. There were no lights on in the rooms, even though her father was home. Elizabeth quietly walked to his bedroom. John was sitting on the bed with some papers next to him. Hello, she said quietly. Why are you sitting here in the dark? Elizabeth's father quickly gathered the papers into a pile and put them in the bedside table. I didn't hear you come in, John said with an ill-concealed sadness in his voice. Dad, is something wrong? Elizabeth asked excitedly. The man didn't know how to tell his daughter that her mother had been kidnapped by the criminals he had once caught. He didn't know how to tell Elizabeth that his wife might not come back, and most importantly, how to let her know that she too was in danger. Elizabeth, the father began to say, please sit down, we need to talk. The girl obediently sat down next to him and looked at her father carefully. The thing is that Ma, the man tried to find the right words, she disappeared. She didn't come back from her shift this morning, I called her, but she didn't answer and no one at work knows anything about where she might have gone. John couldn't tell his daughter the truth, and he didn't know if it made any sense, so he simply told Delise that his good friends would be looking for Diana, and there was nothing to worry about, but at the same time, Elise had to be very careful and attentive. Now he himself will drive the girl to the university and then pick her up. The man also asked his daughter to limit contact with all of his acquaintances for a while and not to go anywhere out of the house, especially when he is at work. The girl did not particularly like this arrangement. She tried to object, but her father was able to convince her of the need for these actions, and Eliza agreed to his conditions. Meanwhile, John involved all his connections in the search for Diana, but everything was in vain. They couldn't find the slightest clue. Whoever had kidnapped her had done everything without a trace. In the end, John had to turn to one Jacob, a respected businessman, Everyone knew that he was on the good side of the big lawbreakers, yet never had any problems with the police. John had no choice but to ask him for help. Much to the man's surprise, the man quickly agreed to help, but in return he made it a condition that Alyssa must become his wife. The girl's father wanted to object to something, but otherwise Jacob refused to help. In the end, John decided it was best for everyone. At least this way Eliza would be well protected and it was unlikely that anyone would dare to cross Jacob by doing something to his wife. When the man returned home, he kept thinking about how to inform his daughter. Unable to think of anything better, John told her as it was. He went into her room, sat down on the couch and spoke. Eliza, this isn't easy for me to say, but I have to do it. What happened? Did something about mom get out? Has she been found? No, I don't really want to talk to you about mom right now. Then what is it? Elizabeth, you have to get married. What do you mean? The girl was surprised. Listen to me. It is simply necessary. I can't protect you all this time. I'm very afraid that something will happen to you, so I just have to protect you in every possible way. Do you mean that now? Yes, Elizabeth, he's a good man. He has everything. He would never hurt you. Daughter, this is really necessary. Just listen to me, please. And let's not make a tragedy out of this. Dad, do you realize what you're saying? You're gonna marry me off to a nobody when I'm 18 years old. I haven't seen life yet. The girl started to shout. Why do I need some strange husband? I don't want to. I can defend myself. John had nothing left but to convince his daughter of the necessity of this marriage. So he calmly, trying to get through to his daughter, began to tell her the truth about what was really going on in their family. It was difficult for John to find the right words not to frighten his daughter, but at the same time to convey to her the complexity of the situation. So he began the story from afar. I don't know if you remember or not, but we didn't always live in the capital. We once moved here from a small town because of my promotion. I helped solve a case involving a group of drug dealers. Those guys were shut down almost immediately and for a long time, but they remembered me well. All these years they've been plotting their revenge, and now they've gone on the offensive. We found out that your mom's disappearance is connected to them. And the other day I got a letter saying that this is just the beginning and they'll get you soon. 
At least, my daughter, I can't lose you too. Jacob is a good man. He can protect you and help you find your mom. I'm asking you to put your emotions away. Hear my words. We need this man or else trouble will happen. Daddy, I'm only 18. Elise whispered, choking back tears. I've never even had a serious relationship, and you're marrying me off to some old man. Daughter, my darling, just believe me when I say it's the right thing to do. It's the best thing for you right now. Jacob is 12 years older than you. That's not that much. He wouldn't dare hurt you. But if you can't take it, you can get a divorce later. For now, you have to save your mother. John tried to keep his face in front of his daughter to convince her of the necessity and at the same time the inevitability of the marriage. Elizabeth couldn't find anything to say to her father. She looked at him with tear-filled eyes, nodded silently and went to her room where she sat for the rest of the evening, silently lamenting her fate. John did not bother her, realizing that now the girl needed to be alone and think about all the information. In the morning, Elizabeth woke up earlier than usual, although it was Saturday and she didn't have to go to the university. She lay in bed for a while, remembering the conversation with her father yesterday. After the girl thought it over, she didn't take it so sharply anymore. After a while, smelling a pleasant odor from the kitchen, Elizabeth got up and went there. John was preparing breakfast. For the first time since Diana's disappearance, he was doing something with such enthusiasm. It even seemed to the girl that her father had somehow revived and cheered up a little. She walked quietly to the table and sat down in a chair. Oh, Elizabeth, did I wake you? No, no. I woke up myself and smelled a very pleasant odor. Now we will have breakfast. John smiled. At breakfast, the man decided to check with his daughter what she had decided from their conversation yesterday. Daughter, did you think anything about our conversation yesterday? The girl grew serious in an instant and replied, Yes, Daddy, I think that if we have a chance to save Mom, we should take it. After all, it's not such a big price to pay. I'm glad I raised such a sensitive and compassionate daughter. Thank you. It's okay, Dad, I understand. After breakfast, John and Elizabeth drove to Jacob's house. The men had arranged the visit the night before. John did not doubt his daughter's prudence. He realized that she would probably agree. Therefore, the man wasted no time and arranged a meeting with Jacob to discuss all the details. Two hours later, John and Eliza were there. Jacob invited them to his country house. They were met by a security guard and after checking their IDs, escorted into his boss's office. Jacob was sitting at his desk, looking over some papers. Elizabeth immediately noticed that the man looked very solid and expensive, yet young. When John entered the office, he said hello loudly. Good afternoon, Jacob, and we're here as agreed. Jacob answered without looking up from his papers. Yes, yes, have a seat. I'm going to finish up some business and we'll have a chat. After 15 minutes of waiting, Jacob finally summoned his assistant and handed him the papers, instructing him to take them to the bank. Afterward, the man turned his attention to Elizabeth. You look even more beautiful than I imagined, Jacob said with a smile. Thank you, Jacob said with a smile. So you've accepted my offer? Yes. Good. Then you can take a walk in my garden while your father and I discuss some details. I'd like to be there too, for it concerns me too. Elizabeth, John interrupted, you don't need to have this conversation. We will call you when it comes to your wedding. The girl looked at the men unhappily, but did not argue any further. She got up from the chair and headed for the exit. One of Jacob's employees was waiting for her at the door whom he had asked to escort her to the garden and fulfill her every request. Good afternoon. I'm here to look after the house. Jacob asked me to escort you to the garden. If you need anything, you can come to me. Thank you. My name is Elise. They went outside. Elizabeth looked around. The garden was very well maintained. There were lots of flowers and trees. Can I ask you something as a woman to a woman, said Elise, trying to be as nice as possible. Of course, said the woman. Anything? What is Jacob like? What do you mean? What kind of man is he? Why doesn't he have a wife? Oh, you mean that? Jacob has always been a very busy man. He took over the business from his father when he was very young. Then he tried to excel at everything, to understand every detail. And now he's gotten pretty good at business. You know, he's very fair. If someone's wrong, he'll always stand up for them and see it through. 
Emma kept her voice a little quieter, as if afraid of being overheard. Jacob had never had much luck with women. He'd been too busy doing things, so he hadn't paid much attention to the matter. He was too busy with business to pay much attention to it. But why did he pick a woman who would actually be excited about this marriage? I don't know that anymore, but I'll tell you this, a lot of people would want to be in your shoes. Jacob is a good man. He would never allow himself to offend a woman. And if he gives his word, he keeps it. Elizabeth's cell phone beeped at the same time. The woman read the message and turned to Elisa. Let's go inside. Jacob wants to talk to you. Elizabeth nodded and followed the woman. She returned to Jacob's study and walked quietly to the chair. What do you think of my garden? Jacob asked Elizabeth. It's beautiful. I didn't expect a single man to have such a well-tended garden. I'm glad you like it. You can come back whenever you want. Now let's discuss the details of the wedding. Eliza, do you have any wishes in that regard? No, she shrugged indifferently. I don't care at all. It is not an event I would like to celebrate. Eliza, why are you so? Intervene in the conversation the girl's father. What about that? I'm telling the truth as it is. Or maybe I need to lie to please all of you. Elise, shame on you. I thought we talked about this this morning. I'm sorry, I'm just still nervous about my mom. What kind of girl wants to play a wedding without her parents? It's okay, Jacob said. I hear you. If you don't want to make a big deal out of it, we can just do it at the registry office and call it a day. I'd appreciate that, Elise replied good-naturedly. The event was scheduled for the following week. John tried to cheer his daughter up, assuring her that Jacob wasn't so bad and that life didn't end there. Elise nodded her head in agreement, realizing that it was probably really the only way out. On the day of the wedding, Jacob arrived at Elizabeth's house in his car. He went up to the apartment and handed the girl a small bouquet of flowers. The girl immediately noted that these flowers were exactly like the ones she had seen from the man in the garden, although the bouquet was not large, but it was assembled very aesthetically and neatly. You look beautiful, Jacob said, looking at Elizabeth. You look great in that dress, and it's a good thing you agreed to wear it. Elizabeth hadn't really planned to dress up, but her father had insisted, arguing that it was necessary to make it look like a real marriage so that the neighbors wouldn't talk, especially Anna who always knew everything about everyone. Eventually, the girl gave in and now she looked like a real bride. Shall we go? The girl asked, starting to get nervous. Jacob looked at his future wife with admiration for a few seconds, and then he took her hand and put it gently in his. They walked out of the driveway and got into the car. The girl's father went with them. He just could not miss this event in his daughter's life. The ceremony was held without surprises. After the registration of the marriage, the young people were given a certificate, and they left for Jacob's house. The man organized a small table, but for him it was definitely a celebration of the end of single life. Toward evening, John said goodbye to his daughter and the owner of the house, and then went home. Eliza tried to talk him into staying, but he said he had to go to work tomorrow and it would be hard to get there. Besides, Jacob hadn't invited him, after kissing his daughter, John got into a cab and drove away. Elizabeth was alone with her new husband. She didn't even want to think about the fact that she had a wedding night ahead of her. Not that she hated Jacob, no. He hadn't done anything wrong to her. He'd always been courteous and gallant, helping her find her mom. But she couldn't go to bed with a man she had no feelings for. She tried to stall for time. First, she wanted to help clear the table, but Jacob had called a maid to do it. Then Elizabeth said she wanted to go for a walk after such an eventful day. Jacob didn't mind. He offered to keep her company. Elizabeth agreed. It was a good opportunity to get to know her husband better, to understand why he had decided to marry her in the first place. They went out into the garden. It was pleasantly cool outside, with floral scents coming from everywhere and cicadas seeing somewhere. Under other circumstances, Elizabeth would have been happy to be here, but not now. After a moment of fresh air, Elizabeth turned to her husband. Jacob, may I ask you a personal question? Elizabeth, let's drop the formalities. I'm not that old. You and I are husband and wife now, and I don't think it's quite right. I'm sorry, it's hard for me to do this right away. Okay, I'll wait. So what did you want to ask? Tell me why me. Why you? Why did you choose me to be your wife? Why not someone else who will love you all your life? 
not someone more age appropriate. And you don't think you're right for me, the man laughed. And love stories are not for me anymore. I need a wife who will respect me and will not look only into my pocket. Your father asked me very much for help, telling me how good you are, how I need to help you. You know, I knew right away you were the one I was looking for. And when I saw you for the first time, I realized that you would not be ashamed to appear in society. Well, Elizabeth, it was just a simple calculation. Well, it's late, I'm tired, and I have to get up early for work tomorrow. Let's go inside. Elizabeth obediently followed Jacob into the house. When they reached the second floor, the man opened one of the doors and gestured for her to enter. Elizabeth took a deep breath and stepped into the bedroom. To her great surprise, Jacob didn't follow her in. He simply wished her a good night, specified that the toilet and shower were in this room so Elizabeth could rest easy. And if she needed anything, there was a telephone in the bedroom, and by dialing a certain number, she could call the maid and voice any request. Jacob would make sure that everyone obeyed her as well as him. The girl thanked her husband, closed the door behind him, sat on the bed and cried. During the night, Elizabeth slept very badly. She woke up every now and then and listened to see if someone was coming. She was afraid that Jacob would change his mind and decide to fulfill his marital duty. But all was quiet. It was not until morning that Elizabeth heard a light knock on the door. She quickly threw on the terry robe she had found in the bathroom yesterday and opened the door. It was Elizabeth. Good morning, Elizabeth. Hello. Jacob asked me to invite you to breakfast. Ah, uh, thank you. I'll be right down. Elizabeth closed the door and went to the mirror. No, you can't sit at a table like this in a decent house, she said aloud, but not to put on a wedding dress. Looking around, Elizabeth stopped her gaze on a large closet. It was unlikely that the girl could find anything suitable in it. So, without understanding why, she went to the closet and opened it. A huge selection of outfits appeared before her eyes. This was nonsense. How could they have thought of everything so well? Or maybe it was someone else's clothes. But having enclosed a couple of dresses, Elizabeth chose one of them. The size was exactly hers, and the dress looked just fine. She walked down to the table like that. Jacob was already drinking coffee, reading something on his tablet. Good morning, Elizabeth said softly. Good morning, Jacob replied, and looked up at his new wife. I see you found your new outfits. Good choice, it looks great on you. Thank you, Elizabeth smiled with the corners of her lips. Have a seat. She sat down on the chair opposite Jacob. Elizabeth brought her breakfast, and Elizabeth silently ate. What are your plans for today? Jacob asked. I'd like to go home and get some things, Elizabeth said, and then hesitated a moment. May I? Why do you ask me if I can or can't? Jacob said with resentment in his voice, you're free to do whatever you want. I'm not forcing you to do anything. If you want to go home, go home. If you want to go out with your friends, I'm not holding you back. I understand. Okay, I won't ask you again. That's great. I suggest you go home with me. I have something to discuss with your father, so I don't see the point in going separately. The only thing is that I have some business to take care of, but it's only for a couple of hours, and then we can go. All right, Elizabeth said. You're doing fine, Jacob laughed. I wish I were. Elizabeth said nothing and continued eating her breakfast. When she was done eating, she got up from the table and wanted to go to her room, but Jacob stopped her. Wait, let's make a deal. You wait for me at home now. I'll go to the office, and then I'll pick you up and we'll go to your father's. Jacob, I just remembered, Dad said he had to go to work today, so I don't think you'll catch him there. Yes? All right, I'll take care of it somehow. After that, the man said goodbye and went to work, and Elizabeth stayed in the house. Out of boredom, the girl decided to walk around the house to see what there is here at all. Despite the fact that from the outside the house seemed small, inside it was just huge. There were many doors that hid some rooms. Opening one of them, Elizabeth found herself in a gym where there were several exercise machines and all the walls were covered with mirrors. In another room, she found a rather spacious bathroom with a jacuzzi in the middle. The third door hid Jacob's office. Elizabeth knew that, but she decided to look inside anyway. Oddly enough, the door was locked. Elizabeth continued her tour of the house. She found a few more bedrooms and showers a kitchen, and a pantry of sorts, where all sorts of things were stored. You can't come in here, 
Elizabeth heard the housekeeper's guilty voice. I'm sorry, I was just wondering what's in this house. It's all right. If you need anything, you can ask me. What's in this room? It's Jacob's bedroom, and no one is allowed in there when he's not here. I see. Well, I'll remember that. Elizabeth smiled and went to her bedroom. The girl picked up her cell phone and dialed her father's number. I'm listening, came the business voice of John, who was obviously busy with something. That high is me. I understand, Elizabeth. You have something urgent to tell me. I'm a little busy. No. I just wanted to tell you that I'm gonna stop by the house in an hour to pack some things. And Jacob wanted to come with me to talk to you about something. I know he did. He called me. I'll be home in an hour. Sweet. Can we talk there? Sure, Dad. Sorry to interrupt. The girl dropped the call and put the phone away. She didn't feel like doing anything, so she just sat in the chair and stared out the window, waiting for Jacob to arrive. He arrived, as promised, exactly two hours later. He went up to Elizabeth's room and asked if she was ready, and when she said yes, they went down to the car and drove to John's. When Elizabeth and Jacob arrived at John's house, he was already home. The man opened the door and looked at his daughter first, as if trying to see if her new husband had offended her in any way. Good afternoon, Jacob said first. May we come in? Yes, yes, of course, come in. Elizabeth silently entered the apartment, hugged her father, and went to her room to pack. John and Jacob went into the kitchen to talk about what to do next. The girl heard only fragments of phrases that made her realize it was about her mother. Jacob had managed to find out something, but it wouldn't be possible to save the woman so easily, so it had to be done cleanly, thoroughly, and for sure. A short time later, John entered his daughter's room. How are you, Elizabeth? All right, even better than she expected. She realized at once that her father was interested in Jacob's attitude toward her and how last night had gone. Jacob didn't hurt you. No, Dad, I'm fine, really. It's good that it's good. He promised me he wouldn't hurt you. Did you guys go over everything you wanted to talk about? Not exactly. We're all going to Jacob's house together now. I've arranged a vacation at work, so I'll stay with you for a week. The man smiled slightly, though his eyes were sad. All this talk about Diana was upsetting him. Did you find out anything about mom? Yeah, there's something, but it's too early to tell. Back at home, Jacob explained that what was needed now was for the kidnappers of Elizabeth's mother to think that they had all gone somewhere else. John took a leave of absence from work, and Elizabeth temporarily stopped going to the university as well. The plan worked and within days a courier was caught delivering the letters. After Jacob's men had worked with him, he gave out some information, of course it wasn't enough, but now they knew what direction to go and where to look. To avoid suspicion, John returned home and Elizabeth and Jacob visited him periodically, so as not to be seen by the kidnappers. Everything seemed to be going as it should, except for one annoying boy who tried to contact Elizabeth, but Jacob could handle that with a little force. Elizabeth was slowly getting used to her new life. She was even beginning to like Jacob's courtesy. Even though they still lived as neighbors, she wanted to get to know her husband better, and he was only too happy to do so. The man was eager to talk to his wife, but it was more like a conversation between two friends. As time went on, Jacob finally had complete information about Diana's whereabouts, where Diana was and who her kidnapper was. To his surprise, the woman had been in town the whole time, never taken anywhere. Still, you couldn't just go and pick her up. You needed bait. What are we going to do? John asked Jacob on his next visit. The only way out is to frame Elizabeth. Are you out of your mind? John was outraged. Quiet. You don't have to talk to me like that, Jacob said calmly. My men will keep the situation under control and nothing will happen to Elizabeth. Hell, yes, I'm as worried as you are, but there's no other way out. If we play it straight now, they'll figure it out and take Diana somewhere we won't find her. We only have one chance. I can't risk my daughter's life. I've already lost my wife and I can't lose my daughter now. I assure you, nothing will happen to Elizabeth. As soon as they are with her, we will take them all and get Elizabeth and Diana. I agree. Suddenly came the voice of the girl who had been eavesdropping under the door all this time. If it will help save mom, we should take that chance. Elizabeth, 
but it's very dangerous. John tried to object. What if things don't go as planned and I lose both of you? That, if Jacob says everything will be all right, then it will be all right. I have no reason not to trust my husband. Jacob looked at Elizabeth with interest. She had never spoken of him that way before and he was pleased. Now he realized that their relationship had reached a new stage. But daughter, dad, don't, don't talk me into it. I've decided I have to go, so I will. Jacob, what do I have to do? It's nothing complicated. You're going to your father's tomorrow night alone. I think they'll meet you there and take you to the base. We'll follow them and use the surprise effect to pick you and your mother up. Only you'll have to pretend you don't know what's going on, much less expect help. Can you do that? I think I can. Good girl. John didn't approve of his daughter's dedication, but he agreed. But he also made it a condition that his staff would take the bastards. Jacob's only request was that they not interfere prematurely and mess things up. The next day, as planned, Elizabeth drove to her father's house in the evening. Two masked men were already waiting for her in the entryway. They put a bag over her head, dragged her into the car, and drove away. Jacob's men followed them. Jacob's men stayed in John's apartment in case anyone else showed up. Meanwhile, the girl's father waited for a message with the coordinates of the kidnappers. Two hours later, the car with Elizabeth's kidnappers stopped. They pulled the girl out and dragged her somewhere again. At some point, they stopped her and removed the bag from her face. Elizabeth looked around. The atmosphere resembled a nightclub. Music was playing. Men and half-naked women were sitting somewhere. Soon, a tall, dark-haired man approached her. He looked at her face for a few seconds and then spoke. Well, we have met, and you are even more beautiful than your mother. You're going to be a star. What's going on? Who are you? What do you want from me? Elizabeth asked fearfully, remembering not to give herself away. We are your new employers, laughed the man and everyone else immediately picked up his laughter. After laughing, the man told them to take Elizabeth to the locker room and dress her in an appropriate outfit for her debut. One of the kidnappers let the girl into some sort of closet, pulled out a sort of swimsuit from the closet and tossed it to Elizabeth. Get dressed, he commanded in a squeaky voice. Why? Don't you get it? Alex is in charge here and he ordered you to get ready for your debut. So get a move on and don't do anything stupid. Will you at least turn around? Elizabeth was trying to buy some time. No way. So you can try to trick me. No way. Get changed. They're waiting for you. The girl began to slowly pull off her clothes while her escort stood in the doorway and watched her with an eager gaze. When Elizabeth took off her clothes and was left in only her underwear, she looked pitifully at the man watching her. The girl had only one thought in her head. Why is no one coming to her rescue? What if something went wrong? Why are you standing there? Keep going. You don't have much time. I can't stand being stared at, Elizabeth said, turning away. Get used to it. The man laughed. Now you'll be stared at all the time. And not just staring. Please, I have nowhere to go. You've blocked the only passage. I'm not going anywhere. Turn around, please. I thought I said no. Or do you have a memory problem? Can I at least cover myself with the closet door? You'll see me like this. The man was clearly sick of all this talk and waved his hand in agreement. Elizabeth quickly grabbed her new outfit and rushed toward the closet. A couple minutes later, she was ready. The new costume barely covered her body parts, so she covered her arms and walked out of the closet. I'm ready, said the girl. Finally. Come on, you've been waiting a long time. What do I have to do? Show yourself how beautiful and skillful you are. If you are a good girl, you might even earn a reward. Elizabeth was very scared, but she held on, trying not to show that they had succeeded in frightening her. They walked down a narrow, dark hallway and found themselves in front of a massive door. Elizabeth's escort knocked lightly on the door and then opened it. Alex, she's ready. Can I start it? Start her up, because our guest is getting bored. The man took Elizabeth by the hand and led her into the room. The girl's gaze immediately fell on a structure that looked like a small stage. Get up, Alex commanded. Elizabeth obediently climbed up on the stage. At that moment, slow music played and spotlights were lit. Now dance. But I don't know how, Elizabeth tried to object. 
you have a great opportunity to learn. Otherwise, we'll have to go straight to dessert, if you know what I mean. The girl's insides grew cold, and now the thought that help might not come in time became more and more intrusive. She decided that there was no other way out, and to delay the inevitable, Elizabeth began to dance. She did it really very ineptly, but judging by the fact that the owner of the place looked at her with satisfaction, the girl realized that he was satisfied with this dance. After a few minutes, Alex was apparently bored with Elizabeth's dance. Now undress, he commanded, but I'm already naked. So take off the rest of your underwear and let's not be silly. You have no choice. Either you obey and do as you are told, and then you will have time to prepare for a stormy night or we have to take you by force. What's it gonna be? I will obey, answered Elizabeth and began to remove her underwear still moving smoothly to the music. When the girl had already taken off her bra, there was a noise outside the door. What the hell is that? Alex roared unhappily. I don't know, the man who had accompanied Elizabeth before answered confusedly. Then go and check it out, you idiot. The man disappeared behind the door, and Alex continued to speak already looking at Elizabeth. Is this your handiwork? I don't know what you mean. All right, if you do. Otherwise, I'll kill you right here and now. After a few minutes, Alex got up from his chair and went to the door. Opening it slightly, he looked out into the corridor. It was dark and he couldn't hear anything. Where did he go, that asshole? Nothing could be assigned. You two, Alex turned to the guys who had been in the room all this time. But Elizabeth had noticed them. Keep an eye on the girl. If she does any tricks, you can hit her, but not in the face. I still need her in a marketable form. After saying that, Alex left the room. Elizabeth wanted to pick up the bra, which she threw under her feet during the dance, but the guards did not let her do it. Don't move, one of them said angrily. Only now Elizabeth noticed that they were armed. Can I get dressed? I'm cold, the girl asked pitifully. It's all right, you can bear it. You can dance to warm yourself up. Elizabeth decided not to anger these guys, so she did not make any other attempts to get dressed. She just crossed her arms over her chest and remained standing in the center of the stage. The girl could see the guards whispering among themselves, occasionally glancing at her with a lustful look. She guessed that they were talking about her, but tried not to think about it. More than anything, she wondered what was going on outside the door right now. Time seemed to be dragging very slowly, but then the door opened and Alex came back into the room. He looked very angry and surprised at the same time. Get out of here, both of you. He growled to his guards and then turned to Elizabeth. Get dressed quickly and come with me. After these words, the man threw the girl some robe. She did not argue, quickly putting on the robe. Elizabeth followed Alex. He led her to the hall she had been brought to originally. Upon seeing her father, Elizabeth rushed over to him. John hugged his daughter tightly. Are you all right? He asked. They didn't do anything to you? They didn't have time. The girl replied in a whisper. I brought her. Alex intervened in the conversation. Now you keep your end of the bargain. No, you haven't brought everyone yet. Where's my wife? I never said anything about a wife. Talk to me again. You're in no position to cross me right now. Alex wrinkled his nose in frustration, but nodded. Wait here. He returned ten minutes later, dragging Diana with him. The woman looked terrible. She could barely move her legs and couldn't lift her head. Diana, John rushed over to her, grabbing her out of Alex's arms. What have you done to her? Nothing much. She's just overworked. Alex grinned haughtily. She'll sleep. She'll be fine. Elizabeth stayed aside. She looked at her mother with horror and waited for this nightmare to end. Soon everyone got into their cars, including Alex, and drove off in the direction of Jacob's house. The car pulled into the yard of Jacob's house. John got out first and opened the door on Alex's side. Get out, we're here. I kept my end of the bargain. Got you to Jacob's place safe and sound. Thank you, Alex replied haughtily. The man jumped out of the car and headed for the entrance where the owner of the house was waiting for him. Hello, little brother, Jacob said. It's been a long time. Hey, you got me after all, Alex grinned. Do you want to come inside? Come on in. Jacob and Alex went out the door. Elizabeth looked on in surprise, not expecting her husband to be her kidnapper's brother. Meanwhile, John, not wanting to waste precious time, 
ordered to take Diana to the hospital. Although the woman slept peacefully the whole way, her condition alarmed him. Elizabeth wished to stay with her parents. When they arrived at the hospital, Diana was hospitalized. She was diagnosed with severe drug intoxication and damage to some internal organs. The doctor said that after the woman came to her senses, she would most likely need not only medical help, but also psychological help. John and Elizabeth were very worried about Diana, but they had no other options, so they left the woman under the care of the doctors and drove back to Jacob's house. It had been about four hours and they still hadn't heard from him. Elizabeth even felt a kind of inner anxiety for her husband. She kept asking to go faster, sensing trouble. Once there, the girl jumped out of the car and ran into the house. Stop! Her father shouted after her. It may be dangerous there. But Elizabeth did not listen to him. She had already run into the house and hid behind its doors. It was suspiciously quiet inside. Elizabeth tiptoed cautiously toward Jacob's study and leaned her ear against the door. But no matter how hard she tried, she couldn't hear anything. She thought the men were talking somewhere else, but suddenly there was the sound of breaking glass. Elizabeth even shuddered with surprise, but gathering her courage, she opened the door. Jacob was sitting in a chair with his head in his hands, and Alex was lying in front of him, not showing any signs of life. The girl shrieked and immediately covered her mouth with her hand. She didn't go unnoticed, though. What are you doing here? Jacob asked, looking up at Elizabeth. I was worried about you, she answered quietly. It's been about five hours since we left, and you still haven't called. You were worried about me. The man asked in surprise. I thought you didn't care much about me. Jacob, why are you doing this? Elizabeth couldn't understand her husband's mood. I'm sorry, it's nervous. What about him? She nodded her head toward Alex. He won't be bothering anyone anymore, Jacob replied with a sad grin. You killed him. Elizabeth was horrified. And even if I did, so what? He's always been too much trouble. Elizabeth didn't know what to say to that, so she stood silent, staring at Jacob and his brother. The silence was interrupted by the voice of the master of the house. You're probably wondering what happened here. Yes, the girl said briefly. Then I will tell you, I've kept this secret for too long. Alex was my paternal brother. When we were kids, we always played together. We had no secrets from each other. We always helped each other and shared everything. But at some point, everything changed. Alex became distant from me. He had his own company. I didn't like them at once, but he didn't care. He started disappearing a lot at night. My father constantly scandalized him for this, but even here Alex remained in his own way. Eventually, he disappeared, and soon our father was gone. His business passed to me, and Alex didn't even show up for the funeral. I found out from my sources that my brother had become a big shot in the criminal world, something to do with drugs, but it was just his choice, so I let him go and took over the business. After a while, he showed up. Alex was scandalized for a long time, saying I'd raided the inheritance for myself. I tried to tell him it was all his fault, but he wouldn't hear of it. All he said was that he'd bring it all back to me. I didn't pay much attention to what he said, but I shouldn't have. About a year later, I met a girl. We were very happy and were going to get married. But Alex stole her away from me. I don't know why she was so attracted to him, but she canceled the wedding and went to him. I suffered a lot, tried to get her back, but it was all in vain. Later, I found out that Alex had put her on some kind of medication, and soon after that she died. Of course, he was responsible for her death. I've been looking for him, but he disappeared and never showed himself until recently. Jacob was silent for a moment, as if considering whether or not to tell Elizabeth what had happened. Jacob remained silent and Elizabeth, who had been standing in the doorway the whole time, approached her husband cautiously. Carefully bypassing Alex, the girl squatted down next to the chair. And what happened then? She asked in a quiet voice. Then what happened was this, Jacob continued, I've been trying to find my brother for a long time. I wanted to get back at him for the girl I loved. Of course, I realized later that it had been her choice in the first place, and she could have gone to anyone else. But at that moment, I blamed Alex for everything, because he had set it all up on purpose and actually killed Veronica. I asked about him everywhere, but he disappeared, and I couldn't find any loose ends. I'd even tried to build some sort of partnership with the most powerful people in the underworld, 
but that didn't work either. No one knew where Alex could be. However, I didn't despair. My hatred for my brother was so strong that I just couldn't let it go. So I got lucky. I think I got a lead on him. One of the guys recognized him, said that he now owned some kind of brothel for special clients, but it was almost impossible to get in unless you were one of his friends. What's more, the place moved every now and then, and if you found it today, you could be sure it would be there tomorrow. I was making plans to get closer to it, and then your father came to ask for help. I could tell from his story that he was probably dealing with Alex's place. I couldn't pass up the chance, especially when he told me they were after you now. I explained to your father that for your safety, you should become my wife, then no one would dare touch you. That wasn't entirely true. I needed to make you trust me and become a front to find your brother. He agreed, of course. You know what happened next, Jacob summarized. What happened here? Elizabeth glanced at Alex's body. We just had a man-to-man -man talk with him. I just wanted him to explain to me why he was doing all this and apologize. It wouldn't have brought Veronica back but it would have made me feel better, I guess, except he decided otherwise. Alex started blaming me again for the way his life had turned out, for having to hide all the time and doing all the dirty work for a long time. And my Veronica deserved all of this, because she ran over to him so easily. After that, I couldn't stand it, I shot him. That's terrible, Elizabeth exclaimed. He deserved it. Jacob suddenly jumped up from his chair and looked fiercely at his wife. Men like him should not live. He has brought so much grief into this world. So many women he has killed in his establishments. After catching his breath, Jacob calmed down and offered Elizabeth his hand. She held hers out incredulously in return. The man lifted her off the floor in one deft movement and looked her intently in the eyes. Thank you for everything. Thank you for not being afraid and trusting me. Now that you know the whole truth, I can't keep you any longer. You're a good girl and you deserve a better fate. You can file for divorce tomorrow, and I'll have to answer to the law for killing my brother. At that moment, John came into the room, who had been standing outside the door listening to their conversation for quite some time. How could you? He said angrily, glaring at Jacob. I trusted you, and you just took advantage of my daughter. You have every right to hate me, but I helped you free your wife, and Elizabeth is fine. John grumbled unhappily, but he had to admit that Jacob was right. I'll help you get away with killing that bastard. We'll make it look like he tried to escape when he was apprehended and had no other choice. There's no telling how my wife will live after all his abuse. I probably shouldn't say this, but everyone will be better off after he's gone. John held out his hand to Jacob, and he responded with a firm handshake. Elizabeth, let's go home. You need to clean yourself up. You've had a rough day. Dad, my home is here for now. I want to stay. The men looked at Elizabeth in surprise. They both did not expect her to make such a decision, but they did not object. If no one minds, I'll go to my room, the girl said, either asking or asserting. Jacob nodded and the girl went to her bedroom. John went home too, having instructed his boys to take care of Alex's body. Jacob stayed in his office for a while, pondering what had happened. At some point, Elizabeth realized that she felt sorry for Jacob. She imagined how long he had suffered, being faithful to only one woman, who had essentially betrayed him by choosing someone else, and worst of all, Jacob's own brother. Even after Elizabeth had learned that their marriage meant nothing to the man and was just a cover, he had always been very courteous and polite to her, never insulting her or mentioning other women to her, sometimes giving her flowers and small gifts. Now Elizabeth sat on her bed and tried to figure out how she felt about Jacob. Maybe fate had brought them together for a reason. Maybe she should give him a chance. On the other hand, she didn't know if he needed a chance or not. After much deliberation, Elizabeth went into the shower. Standing under the jets of water, she washed off all the dirt and unpleasant memories of today. Of course, it didn't help much but still the water allowed her to relax a little. The girl stepped out of the shower, wrapping herself in a towel. The room was dark, with only moonlight coming through the window. Elizabeth walked to her bed and only at that moment noticed that she was not alone. She looked up and saw Jacob sitting on a chair, staring at her. They were both silent for a while. It didn't bother Elizabeth that she was standing in front of a man almost naked. She just waited to see where this was going. Finally, Jacob broke the silence. Why did you decide to stay? 
because you're my husband and I've gotten used to you. Even in spite of what you've learned today, the man asked in surprise, do you still want to be near me? Yes, Elizabeth nodded her head. I think anyone would do that if they were you. Well, maybe not anyone, but anyone who had the opportunity would. What do you want? Jacob asked with interest. I don't know, she shrugged. Maybe we should try to live like a real husband and wife. Why would you do that? The man wondered. Why do you want a man who is so disfigured by life, who is capable of murder and has no regrets about it? He deserved it, cried Elizabeth, who had her mother in her mind's eye. After what he did to my mommy, he didn't deserve to live, and how many others like her were tortured to death by him. If it wasn't for you, there might have been more. Prison's no place for them. He'd get out and go back to doing his dirty work. Well, thank you for your support, Jacob smiled. The man got up from his chair and slowly walked over to Elizabeth. He ran his palm over her cheek, then ran his hand through her hair and froze, looking her straight in the eye. The girl put her hand on his and looked at him too, not taking her eyes off him. At one point she opened her lips slightly, as if to suggest that she was ready for more intimacy. Jacob's reaction was quick, and he gently tilted his head and kissed her softly. It was a very tender yet passionate kiss. The man didn't want to push Elizabeth and take advantage of her, realizing that the adrenaline from today's adventures was now playing in her blood. Jacob slowly pulled away and looked Elizabeth in the eyes once more. Elizabeth, I've told you before that you're a very good girl, so I don't want you to do anything rash that you'll regret. Go to bed. We'll come back to this another time. Jacob kissed her lightly on the forehead and left the room. Elizabeth went to bed and fell fast asleep. Jacob wondered how his life would turn out now and what he would do with Elizabeth. If on any other day he would have been happy to take advantage of her weakness, he couldn't do it now. This girl had become special to him, probably even more special than the Veronica he had once loved. The man decided that Elizabeth's attraction to him must soon pass and she would leave, leaving him alone. He just couldn't let any girl break his heart again. In the end, Jacob made a difficult decision. He told Elizabeth that he had to leave in the morning to take care of some business matters because he lost track of things and now he had to catch up. Of course, that wasn't true. Jacob just wanted to leave Elizabeth alone to think things over. He was pretty sure that by the time he got back, the girl would be gone and everything would be back to normal. Jacob rented an apartment not far from his office and at first he wanted to get out of town, but he couldn't do that. Business required constant supervision and prompt action. Elizabeth stayed at Jacob's house. She called and texted him every day, just to see how he was doing and if he planned to return. The man tried to ignore her calls and rarely responded to texts, citing his business, and in return messages, he usually wrote duty phrases, everything is fine or normal. Elizabeth wasn't offended by this attitude. She thought Jacob's business was really important and she could wait until he was free. A month passed. During that time, Elizabeth had time to sort herself out and realize how she really felt about her husband. And if before the feelings had been caused by a surge of adrenaline, now she could appreciate the kindness and attention Jacob had shown her all the time they had spent together. Elizabeth looked at him with different eyes now. When they first met, marriage to Jacob had been the only option to save herself and her mother from the bandits. Now that Elizabeth was free to choose, she saw her husband as a male companion. Jacob was a good-looking man for his age, but he wasn't boring and understood what she was saying. Jacob had recently begun to notice that he waited for messages from his wife and was worried when she did not write him anything. He even wanted to leave everything and go home, but he changed his mind almost immediately, deciding that not enough time had passed for Elizabeth to make the right decision. He stalled, staying in the rented apartment, even though he wanted to go home. At one point, Jacob even wanted to be distracted by another woman, but all his attempts failed. Everything seemed to be going well at first, but then he found himself thinking only of his wife and not even hearing what she was saying. In the end, he decided to return home. If Elizabeth had waited so long for him, she must really love him. Jacob decided not to tell his wife that he was coming home. He wanted to give her a little surprise. After buying a beautiful bouquet of flowers on the way, he went to Elizabeth's house. When he got home, he saw the following picture. 
Elizabeth sitting on the floor, sobbing quietly, with shards of colored glass all around her. Jacob dropped everything from his hands and ran over to her. Elizabeth, sweetheart, what's wrong? Why are you crying? Did you cut yourself? Let me take you to the hospital. Jacob asked questions as he examined Elizabeth's body for cuts. The girl looked up with tears in her eyes. She seemed so small and defenseless at that moment. I don't know how it happened, she said stammering and began to cry again. Jacob gently lifted her off the floor, put his arms around her, and stroked her head. Shesh, Elizabeth, it's all right. Tell me what happened. I don't know how it happened, but I snagged your vase. It must be very expensive. Jacob, I'm sorry, Elizabeth cried again. To hell with the vase. Jacob said so loudly that Elizabeth was quiet. I'll buy you a dozen more if you want them. Elizabeth stood silently in Jacob's arms for a while, then pulled away gently and looked at him. Why didn't you tell me you were coming? I wanted to surprise you, Jacob smiled. I did, but it was an unpleasant surprise, she grinned sadly. Elizabeth, forget about that vase. I don't need it. I need you. And I am very glad that you waited for me and did not run away. Really? Elizabeth asked incredulously. Of course I am. Elizabeth, I want you to be my wife, my real wife. I want to keep you safe from danger. I want to hear your laughter every day and see your charming smile. Looking around, the man saw the flowers he had bought for his wife. He gently took Elizabeth's hands off of him and walked over to pick up the bouquet. This is for you, though it's a little crumpled from the fall, but still, I think you'll enjoy it. Of course, if you want, I'll buy you some other flowers right away. Thank you. They're very pretty, the girl replied with a smile. She walked over to Jacob and hugged him again, their lips touching. The kiss was so sensual and tender. She wanted it to last forever. It was the first time they had ever been intimate. Elizabeth gave herself completely to the caresses of her husband, and he in turn tried to make her as happy as possible. From that day on, they began to live as a complete family. Elizabeth was glad that things had turned out this way. And even though her first meeting with Jacob had not been pleasant, she was glad that things had turned out this way. Jacob was glad, too, to have met Elizabeth's father, and he was grateful that she hadn't run away from him at the first opportunity. Elizabeth's mother was slowly beginning to get better, though she was still a long way from full recovery. The doctors recommended that she move to some small, quiet town near the sea, and John, of course, complied. He quit his job, took his wife, and they moved to the Black Sea. Jacob offered to buy them a house somewhere abroad, but Elizabeth's parents refused, wanting to stay in their native land. Elizabeth and Jacob often came to visit them and help them financially. After graduation, Elizabeth got a job at her husband's firm. He gave her a position in the International Relations Department, and she did very well. Despite the fact that everything seemed to have settled down and everyone was happy, this story left an indelible mark on everyone's soul. Diana was unbearably bored. All day long, she had to devote herself only to her two-year-old daughter. Was that what she was aiming for when she was so diligently wooing the rich and promising John? Diana had succeeded. She married him. But it wasn't how she'd envisioned a wealthy family life. In Diana's dreams, it looked different. She imagined how Mary will travel abroad, dine only in expensive restaurants, visit beauty salons and lying by the pool, sipping cocktails. In reality, it didn't work out that way. John worked all day and yes, she was not mistaken. He was a very promising young man. He had recently purchased a large two-story cottage in an elite area of the city. However, the repair was not yet finished and even now on the second floor of the incessant drilling, knocking workers, talking in an incomprehensible language. Immediately after the wedding, John insisted on having a child, which Diana was not ready for. She has long tried to persuade her husband to live for himself, but the man was adamant. At the time of the wedding, he was 30 years old, and he was ready for fatherhood. But Diana was only 22, and she wanted to flutter and enjoy life. It didn't work out. A year later, Alice was born, and Diane had to immerse herself in endless diapers, diapers and formula. Sleepless nights and baby sores drove the girl crazy. John, on principle, did not hire a nanny to help Michael. He turned out to be a good husband, caring and generous, but at the same time, too authoritarian. 
The man had his own principles and he never deviated from them. One of these principles was that he believed that the young wife should watch over her daughter only herself. My mom raised me without any nannies. That's why we had such a close bond until the day she died. And you'll be fine. So tell me, what else do you have to do? We hired an au pair. No cooking, no cleaning. Just devote yourself to your daughter dying. That's easy to say, devote yourself. Every day is Groundhog Day. Diana hated even going to the park, where there was a big playground. That's where all the rich moms in the neighborhood usually gathered. At first, Diana was happy to get to know them all, hoping to socialize with them. But socializing with them was just talking about the kids. Diana was sick of it. If it were up to her, she wouldn't shove her nose on the playground. But John insisted on daily walks, saying the baby needed fresh air. Of course he needed fresh air, Diana grumbled, gathering her daughter for a walk. Then he would walk by himself, among these clutches. Happy Alice grabbed her sandbox set and a ball. The girl did not fit all this in her hands and she, frowning her eyebrows, looked at her mother. Alice, let's take one thing, either a ball or a set. The girl hardly spoke yet, but she was good at the word no. Diana sighed unhappily, took the ball in her hands and went to the exit of the cottage. On the one hand, getting out into the fresh air now was better than being among the endless sounds of the renovation. Diana and her daughter had just left the gate when a tin car pulled up sharply beside them. Diana's excited friend Anna jumped out of it. Diana, hi. It's so great that I managed to catch you. Look, with what guys I met, Anna led her eyes in the direction of the car, from the windows of which two handsome guys were smiling. We're going to the beach now. Come with us. Diana was horrified. John would kill me if he found out. How would he find out? You'll be home before he gets home. If anything, you can tell him you got held up walking your daughter in the park. Alice won't give us away, will she? Anna winked at the little girl, knowing she wasn't talking yet. Diana hesitated. On the one hand, she really wanted to have fun with these cute guys. But on the other hand, she was afraid that her husband might find out. The girl was silent, thinking, and Anna hurried her. Diana, let's go. Don't let me down. I said I'd be with a friend. The guys are shopping for the picnic. They got champagne for you and me. I don't know what to think. Just get in the car. Okay. Diana's making up her mind. Is it okay that I'm with child? I told the guys you're a young mom. It's okay. Alice can play on the beach. What difference does it make to her where she builds her dollies? Diana nodded and taking her daughter in her arms went to the tent. She sat on the back seat, met the guys and asked them to stop by the store on the way to buy juice and cookies for her daughter. The girl needed something to do too. The guys drove to a remote beach where Diana had never been before. Wow, she exclaimed, getting out of the car and lowering her daughter onto the sandy beach. What a steep shore here. Yes, nodded one of the guys. It's pretty dangerous in this place. I'll tell you more. There's a whirlpool under that steep shore. You can get sucked in in no time. We won't swim there. We'll swim here, where there's a gentle slope. At least it's less crowded. Imagine how crowded the city beaches are now. There's nowhere to spit. Diana agreed with that. Going to a crowded beach in the company of guys, a married girl does not need to. And here, in fact, it was not crowded. Apart from their company, there was only a young married couple with a boy of about five years old. The wife was in an old faded swimsuit, long out of fashion, and the couple had nothing on the bedspread except a water bottle. How did they get here? Anna asked in a whisper, I don't see a car. They probably came on foot, grinned one of the guys, taking bags of food and drinks out of the trunk. All right, let's get away from them and start getting settled, girls. There's a blanket over there. Lay it down. In half an hour, the merry company, which had time to swim, was laughing. The guys, despite the fact that one of them was driving, drank strong alcohol. And Diana and Anna sipped champagne coquettishly. Diana didn't regret in the slightest that she had agreed to this trip. It had been fun with the guys. And Alice, apparently, was not bored. The beach was sandy and the girl did her favorite thing. Armed with a set for the sandbox, little girl diligently tried to mold figures. Bakum, a little shy, a boy approached her, the son of the vacationers in the neighborhood. Alice smiled and handed him her trowel. 
When the boy took it, the girl ran to her mom and pointed to the juice box. Diana stuck a tube in it and handed the juice to her daughter. Alice went back to her new friend and generously handed him the juice, but then the mom pulled the girl back. Alice, don't let the boy drink from your tube. You can't do that. What if he's sick? The boy's parents heard this shout and looked at each other. I should have bought Michael some lemonade, the young woman sighed. The man nodded sullenly at her. Georgia shivered slightly under the appraising glances of the girls in the neighboring company. Her husband jumped up from his seat and took Michael by the hand and walked toward the river. He offered to take a swim, but she didn't feel like it. She felt uncomfortable when the girl forbade her daughter to share her juice with Georgia's son. And they only had a bottle of water with them. It's understandable, the family was desperately short of money. Georgia and her husband Steve had recently bought a one-room apartment and had gotten into huge debts. To pay off these debts, Steve worked like a curse, grabbed any part-time job, and when he was offered a callum on the replacement of the roof in one of the houses of the private sector, the young man happily grabbed it. Of course, safety in such places was completely absent, and Steve did not hold on to the roof and collapsed, suffering injuries. It took him several months to recover and he was unable to work during that time. George's nurse's salary was barely enough to pay the rent and buy a rudimentary set of groceries, and the family still had to pay for kindergarten, buy him clothes and wanted to treat the child sometimes, which unfortunately happened less and less often. Steve didn't work, debts were piling up, but Georgia didn't despair. Nothing. Steve is a very hard-working man and is almost well. Pretty soon he'll be back to work and the family will be back on their feet, paying off their debts. Today Georgia had a rare day off and she wanted to get away with her beloved family. They'd chosen this normally deserted beach to get away from people. It didn't matter that it was a 40-minute walk to the beach. As luck would have it, this rowdy bunch of guys rolled in and ruined Georgia's mood. She knew one of the guys visually. He'd gone to the same school as her and lived not far from her parents. The rest of the merrymakers were unfamiliar to Georgia. The girl immediately noticed the arrogant, appraising look the girl's mom gave her and she felt a little ashamed of her old swimsuit. Well, so be it. Immediately restrained Georgia. Let me wear a swimsuit of a hundred years ago, but next to my beloved husband and son. I'm happy with them and someday we'll have everything. The company was walking very cheerfully, noisily splashing in the river, loudly clinking, laughing. The little girl was left to herself, and it was evident that she was very glad when Michael joined her in her games. But then the girl's mother shouted at her and Georgia realized that the rest was ruined. Steve, I'm tired. Why don't we go home? She said quietly to her husband. The man looked at her shrewdly. He understood his wife with half a word. Well, let's have one last rinse. Are you coming? Georgia shook her head in the negative and Steve, shouting to the son, went with him to the river. After a while, Diana, who was already quite tipsy, noticed that the couple resting in the neighborhood began to gather. Oh, at last, she wrinkled her pretty nose. Finally, they are leaving. I do not like that my Alice with this boy plays. They are like that. What are they like? Asked Diana, one of the guys with whom she was having fun. I know this girl. I went to school with her. She's all right. And her husband seems to be quite normal. Diana shrugged uncertainly and turned away from the couple. Let's have a drink, she said cheerfully and grabbed a shot glass with strong alcohol, as they had long since finished the champagne with Anna. The girl Alice stood on the sand and sadly watched her new acquaintance, a boy Michael. Taken away from the beach by his mom and dad, the girl kicked the ball with all her might and it rolled down the beach and rolled down a steep cliff. Alice ran after the ball. The girl ran up to the cliff. The ball was not visible. Alice carelessly hung down, trying to see it in the water. Through the loud laughter, no one but Anna heard a slight shriek and a splash of water. Anna looked around and didn't immediately realize that something was wrong. When she did, she shouted loudly, Diana, where's Alice? Where is your daughter? Diana looked around with a dazed look. Where is she? Where did she go? She didn't run away. She fell in the water. I heard a splash. As if on cue, the whole group jumped to their feet and ran to the steep bank. There were circles in the water, 
and in the center of those circles Alice's ball floated orphaned. Diana abruptly began to sober up and was thrown into hysterics. Alice, daughter, I can't swim, somebody jump in. Save my daughter, the girl threw herself on the guy's chests. But her new acquaintances stood there with their eyes down. They had warned in advance about the whirlpool in this place and they didn't want to drown because of a girl they didn't know and her child. Diana howled and tried to push the boys to the shore to save Alice, but they froze in place. And then, past the standing guys and the girl struggling between them, a male figure flashed by lightning and dived into the water. Steve, what are you doing? There was a shout behind them. It was Georgia, literally dragging her son by the hand. She and her husband hadn't gotten far before they heard Diana howling. Steve instantly realized what was going on and reacted with lightning speed. Georgia and Michael ran to the shore and now, along with the others, kept their eyes on the water closing over Steve. The time dragged on for an agonizingly long time. It was only a few seconds, but it seemed an eternity to those standing on the shore. It was little Michael who was the first to fall. The boy roared loudly and began to call for his father. Then Georgia screamed. Panic grew. The girl's head appeared on the surface of the water with her eyes closed. Steve came up next, struggling to breathe and trying to push the little girl out of the maelstrom. It was obvious that the man was exhausted. The boys on the shore fussed. They scrambled down and getting as far into the water as they could, held out their hands to the girl. Steve pushed the little girl toward them as hard as he could and disappeared under the water in the same second. Diana ran around the shore around her pale daughter, who was being given CPR by Anna, and ignored the wailing Georgia, whose husband had not come out of the water. Alice coughed and opened her eyes. Diana exhaled, grabbed her daughter in her arms, held her tightly against her. The girl cried. Only then did Diana look at Georgia running along the shore and almost tearing her hair out. What about her husband? One of the boys shook his head mournfully, lowering his eyes. That was it. He didn't swim out. I guess his strength's gone. Should we call whoever we're supposed to call in these cases? Police? Divers? How do we call them? Diana was confused. Then everyone will know. Find out what? The guy didn't understand. That we were here. My husband will know. No, I can't let that happen. You call whoever you want. I'm calling a cab and I'm leaving. Diana, what are you doing? That man drowned to save your daughter, and he saved her, a dazed Anna exclaimed. And I'm grateful to him for that. Diana cut him off, but my husband mustn't know anything about it. The bewildered Georgia floundered on the shore. The girl hardly realized what was happening and did not notice the moment when the cab left the beach with her daughter. It still seemed to Georgia that Steve was about to surface and she ran, keeping her eyes on the water. When the police arrived, she begged them to get her husband out and Michael roared loudly as he sat on the sand. At some point, Georgia came to her senses, walked over to her son and slumped down beside him and put her arm around his shoulders. Don't cry, son. Daddy will be all right. He must have surfaced somewhere else. The girl herself believed what she was telling her son. How could it be any other way? She couldn't think of any other outcome. They can't be without Steve. They just can't. And he can't just leave them alone. After a while, the policeman began to insist that Georgia should go home and the search should continue here without her. The girl shook her head stubbornly, sitting on the sand and hugging her son. She began to sway, as if in a trance from side to side. One of the policemen, wanting to bring the girl to her senses, said to her rather rudely, Stop thinking about yourself and think about your child. Look at your son. Why should he see all this? These words sobered Georgia a little and she looked at Michael. The boy couldn't cry anymore. He whimpered like a frightened kitten, clinging to his mother's side and staring at the river with swollen slits in his eyes. Yes, Michael, come on. I'll take you to grandma's. Then I'll be back. She turned to the policeman. Back as soon as I take the baby to his mom. Steve wasn't found until the third day, when his body floated to the surface. Diane was waiting for her husband to come home from work. In the last few days, she had been such a good wife, just a goody-goody. In fact, the girl was very scared. Every day, she called her friend Anna and found out how the search for the man who had saved her daughter was progressing. 
Strictly Nastrigo Diana had instructed Anna to keep silent about their presence on the beach. Although, of course, both the police and the lifeguards were aware that the man they were looking for was a hero who had saved a child at the cost of his own life. But the mother of this child did not want publicity and left before the police arrived on the scene. Well, that's her right. No one could force gratitude. Still, Diana was shaking. Every day, when her husband returned from work, the first thing she did was to look anxiously into his face to see if he had found out anything. The girl realized that she was guilty on all sides. She went to the beach with strange guys, drank with them and poorly washed her daughter. Yes, what a sin to say, Diana at that moment was a lot of fun and at times she even forgot that Alice was playing nearby. But then again, even in those thoughts, Diana managed to blame her husband. It was his own fault. Locked her here, in four walls with a child, no rest, no respite. So she went off the rails. Obviously, John wouldn't accept that excuse. What would he do if he knew the truth? Divorced her the same day, at the very least. Diana was sure of that, knowing well the resolute temper of her husband. He'd also be able to sue for his daughter on the basis of what had happened. Diana shuddered at the thought. Don't think about bad things. Everything will be fine. Anna would keep quiet. It was her fault, and the boys knew nothing about Diana. Through the window opened on the first floor, Diana heard her husband's car drive into the yard. The girl put on a smile, fixed a beautiful bow on her daughter's head and ran to meet her husband. Oh, John, you're earlier than usual today. Alice and I missed you. Haven't we, Alice? John smiled dutifully at Michael, absorbed in his own thoughts, and at dinner he was quite distracted, nodding occasionally at Diana's incessant chatter. John, what are you always thinking about? My wife couldn't stand it. Do you even listen to what I'm telling you? Yeah, I'm sorry, I was just thinking. I heard a story today. A man drowned in our town four days ago. They pulled him out yesterday. No, I haven't heard Diana's tense. Well, drowned and drowned, it happens. Why do you care so much? It's just the details. The man rushed to save someone else's child, a girl, I think. He managed to save her, pushed her to the surface, but he ran out of strength and drowned. Can you imagine? Well done, what can I say, Diana shrugged. He's not just a good man, John said indignantly. The man is a hero. I keep thinking, yes, many people would give their lives for their own child. John looked at Alice, but for someone else's. Let's say, would I be able to throw myself into the maelstrom for someone else's child like him? I don't know, I'm not sure. It's a very dangerous place and everyone knows it. That man knew it too, and he deliberately took the risk for someone else's girl. I admire people like that. Diana sat there, dead or alive. How unpleasant this conversation was for her. She really wanted to change the subject, but John wouldn't let her. No, but you know what the best part is. The mom of the rescue girl took her daughter and left the shore right after the man drowned. She didn't wait for the rescuers, nor did she express her gratitude to this Michael, who was also there by the way. Nothing. Nobody knows who she is. The only rumor is that she was drunk and didn't take care of her child. It was entirely her fault that the girl fell into the river. So drunk, Diana muttered angrily, I don't know how life happens. John, we don't know all the details. Let's not judge anyone. I am. John said defiantly, I do judge a mother like that. She goes to the river with a little kid and drinks there. She's probably from a dysfunctional background and unmarried. A normal woman wouldn't act like that. And that man had a family, a small son. They say they were already poor. And now they were left without a breadwinner. And for whom, you ask yourself? Some naughty mom. The more her husband got angry, the colder Diana got. It's even worse than she thought. I can't imagine what her husband would do if he found out she was his wife. John, what if you and I were to take a trip somewhere? Diana blurted out. No, but seriously, you and I had a lot of fun. We didn't go on a wedding trip. Then Alice was born. Let's go on vacation. Okay, let's try it. John suddenly agreed. Tomorrow I'll go to work and try to solve the most important issues. Maybe we'll go to the sea, if only for a while. The next day Diana was not herself. She couldn't wait for John to come home from work, and her anxiety was growing. She wanted to get out of town before this story died down. 
Her husband had gotten a little too emotional about the so-called hero's behavior. Diane called her husband to see if he had been able to settle the important issues and if the trip would take place. When John reassured her, Diana happily rushed to the second floor to pack her things. Just then, the all pair called out to her, Diana, there's a girl at the gate asking for you. What girl? Diana was surprised. It was Sveka again. She jumped out and with a quick step, reached the gate and opened it. All the blood drained from Diana's face when she saw who stood before her. It was Georgia, the drowned man's wife. How did you find me? Diana hissed at Georgia, closing the gate tightly behind her. One of the guys you were on the beach with told me the address. He and I went to the same school. Georgia answered in a weak, quiet voice. She was staggering and dark circles under her eyes. She couldn't remember the last time she'd eaten or if she'd eaten at all since her husband's death. But Diana didn't care about the appearance of this grief-stricken girl. She was only angry. Angry that Georgia had come to her house. What do you want? Why did you come here? She asked her rudely. Georgia didn't seem to notice the aggression directed at her and continued to talk quietly. You know, Steve was just found yesterday. His body. Now it's a funeral, and I don't have any money to bury him. We don't have any money. Not me. Not my mom. There's no one to turn to. We already owe everyone. Steve didn't work for a while. He was sick. What's it got to do with me? Why did you come to me? It was only now that Georgia began to realize how rude Diana was being to her. She looked up, scrutinizing her face. I thought maybe you could help me with money. I'll give it back. Not right away. But I'll give it back. Oh, that's it. You've come to beg for money. You think because your husband died for my daughter, I owe you money? Did I ask him to do that? It was only his decision. He couldn't assess his own strength. Couldn't get out. Whose fault is that? All right, well, just stay here. I'll be right back. Diana ran into the house and Georgia stood puzzled. This was not the reaction she'd expected from the rescue girl's mom. Oh, not this. Georgia knew that if someone had saved Michael, she would have given that person everything she had and been grateful to the end of her life. And all she'd come to Diana for was alone. While Georgia was pondering, Diana jumped out of the gate and shoved a couple of crumpled bills into the girl's sweaty palm. Here, take these. I won't give you any more, and don't come here. You hear me? You don't have to give anything back, but don't ever show your face here again. And don't you dare implicate me in your husband's death. He took a dive, he drowned. Nobody pushed him into the river. Georgia stared into Diana's face with wide open eyes. She didn't even look at the denomination of the bills now clutched in her hand, but raised her hand and threw them at Diana's face with fury. Choke on your hand out. I don't know what my husband would have done knowing what you were like. He probably would have died for the girl anyway. That was Steve's thing. But except that I, if it were possible to rewind time, would never have let him jump in the river. I have hung a rock around his neck and held him down, wouldn't have let him. Georgia turned and walked away from the gate, and Diana picked up the bills from the ground and ran into the house, looking around cautiously to see if anyone had seen the scene. A couple days later, Steve's funeral was held. There were a lot of people there, and they were mostly strangers who didn't care. Many people in town had heard how the young man had died, and contrary to Georgia's expectations, the funeral was decent. People who learned about the difficult material polymaclia of the hero's family began to bring his wife money. They brought free of charge, who can bring as much as they can, from the world by the thread, as they say. The largest sum was brought to the girl from a businessman who wished to remain anonymous. The girl could not believe how many people around her cared and was immensely grateful to them. But the loss of her husband was very hard for her. For the first year, the girl lived as if in a trance, floating along the stream, not noticing anything and no one around, except for her son. Money was constantly lacking, debts had not gone anywhere, and despite Steve's death, they had to be paid. Georgia worked 24 hours a day, taking a nursing job. She pulled the strain forgetting about herself and seeing the child only at night, but at the same time trying to make sure that he had everything he needed. Michael went to school, and despite the fact that his mother never had time to do his homework with him, he studied very well. The boy became independent early, 
Being with him in public Georgia often caught envious glances of her son in the direction of children proudly walking with their dads. When Michael was nine years old, a patient with an attack of appendicitis was admitted to the hospital where Georgia worked. This man was much older than Georgia, but nevertheless immediately began to give signs of attention to the young nurse. At first the girl only waved away from such an intrusive bow, but then she thought. And why not? The man seems to be not bad, divorced. According to him, he's very fond of children, and Michael needs a man's attention. Georgia made up her mind and tried to introduce the man, whose name was Dustin, to her son. She was very nervous bringing a man into the house for the first time. Contrary to her fears, Michael took to Dustin calmly and even joyfully. The boy told his new acquaintance passionately about his schoolwork, and he listened attentively, shaking his head respectfully. Georgia exhaled with relief. So that's the way it's going to be. Michael would need a father. And she could stop working around the clock and spend more time with her son. It's so wonderful to have a strong male shoulder to lean on. In three months, Georgia and happy Michael moved into Dustin's apartment. It was a rather spacious two-bedroom apartment in which the boy finally had his own room. Dustin was very kind and attentive, but only for the time being. As time went on, Georgia began to notice that the child was annoying her new man. Michael was so attracted to him and was ready to call him daddy, but apparently his stepfather didn't want him to. Call me Uncle Dustin. I'm not your daddy. You're not a little boy. You understand everything. Dustin snapped at the boy, and Michael shrank back. Everything seemed to be the same, except that now Michael didn't run to his stepfather to brag about his success in school and tell him about his affairs. Dustin seemed to enjoy it. Over time, Georgia began to realize that this man needs more of a mistress in the house, who will cook, clean, and the child was in his way. And one day, far from being a beautiful day, Georgia returned from her shift and from the doorstep heard her son crying. The woman rushed into the room and saw Michael standing in the corner. His legs were covered in red stripes and his belt was lying next to him. Dustin, smirking smugly, sat in a chair. Oh, you're here? Listen to what your son has done. Georgia didn't want to hear anything. The blood rushed to her head. The woman grabbed the belt that was lying on the floor and threw herself at the man, trying to whip him as hard as she could. She failed, of course. A small, angry woman jumping with a belt in her hands near a tall man looked silly. Not expecting such a violent reaction, Dustin intercepted Georgia's arm. What are you so mad about? He's a boy, and boys are supposed to be raised. It wasn't a big deal. I whipped his ass. My father used to whip my ass like that when I was a kid. That's why I grew up to be a man. Georgia cried. She threw the belt away and ran to her son, who was still roaring in the corner. Michael, Michael, come on. We're going back to our apartment right now. You will never see that man again. After her failed affair with Dustin, Georgia had stopped looking at men altogether. The young woman had come to believe that strangers could never treat her son as their own, and she didn't want to worry about whether her new husband had hurt Michael. Besides, Georgia hadn't been able to get rid of Dustin for quite some time. After she and Michael had left, he'd initially stopped the woman, begging her to come back, saying he'd made a mistake and would never lay a finger on the child again. But Georgia did not even consider the option of returning. She has a strong aversion to Dustin. It turned out to be not all surprises on the man's part. Once he was convinced that the woman had left him for good, he showed his true, vindictive, vindictive nature. Dustin began filing complaints about Georgia to the head doctor as an incompetent medical professional, and he also stalked her co-workers and told them nasty things about the woman. Georgia was shocked by these behaviors, but Dustin didn't accomplish anything with it. Georgia was too well known at work to believe the ravings of an offended man. All of these events only reinforced Georgia's belief that she shouldn't consider men as potential husbands. She should devote herself to Michael, which she did. Georgia got back on her feet and started working around the clock to provide for her son. The woman's life resembled a daily struggle for survival, but her son pleased her as he grew up a boy smart, kind, fair. He's a lot like Steve. Georgia often thought, only, is that a good thing? What did my husband's kindness lead to? To leaving us alone for the happiness of another man's family. 
It was that very family that Georgia saw in all its glory. Early one morning, she was coming back from another part-time job, tired. She had only a few hours to sleep and then back to the hospital. And then a large white car pulled up not far from her. Georgia didn't know much about cars, but even from the look of it, she could tell that it was very expensive. A man got out of the car first, and Georgia didn't pay him any attention until Diana stepped out of the passenger door. Georgia recognized her immediately in a flash. That hateful face seemed to have gotten even more beautiful. Why prettier? It was just better groomed. Now seeing Diana, the only expression that came to mind was gorgeous woman. Meanwhile, the man stepped to the back door of the car and having opened it, helped the girl to get out. Alice was wearing a beautiful pink coat and white boots. Georgia's heart skipped a beat and she fixed her gaze on the child's face. It was because of this girl that her beloved husband was not in the world right now. Steve had given his life for her. Now she lit us and he doesn't, and it could have been the other way around. How many times had Georgia replayed in her mind the events of that fateful day? Had they left then, just a few minutes earlier, and things would have gone differently. Steve would be alive and Michael would be growing up with a full family. And the woman herself wouldn't have had to work around the clock to feed her child. Steve. The woman's eyes filled with tears at the memory of him. How much she had loved him. He was probably the only man she could love in her life. Beautiful and happy as they looked, the family disappeared behind the doors of a store and Georgia watched them go. She hated Diana, but worst of all, and she couldn't help it, she seemed to hate the girl too. Her mind knew that the child was innocent, but her heart fluttered at the sight of this pretty little girl whose life her husband had given his own. Diana shrugged her shoulders shakily. She hadn't noticed Georgia, but she could feel the hateful stare directed at her back. Diana was already angry. Today, John had decided to take the day off, and instead of taking her to a restaurant, instead of devoting it to Michael, for example, he'd taken her and his daughter to a children's clothing store. Although Alice's closets are already overflowing with clothes. What's a baby need? She's growing up, and some things do not even have time to wear once. And John liked to pamper the girl, dressing her up in expensive things, giving her toys without measure. What else can he do? Grinned Diana. He won't have any other children. At least he's made peace with that. As soon as Alice was a little older, her husband began to insist on having a second child. John wanted a son. He just wanted a son. And Diana was horrified at the suggestion. What child? She only had Alice off her hands. Diana exhaled, being able to take time for herself. And here it was again. The mere thought of sleepless nights with a baby in diapers terrified Diana. No, she didn't want that to happen again. She's not a soul after all, to give birth on demand. She wanted to live and live beautifully. Obviously, if Diana told her husband about it, he would only freak out. So she decided to do the trick here. For a long time, the woman pretended that she could not get pregnant diligently protecting herself secretly from John. Then she got herself a fake checkup. In reality, the woman paid the head doctor of the gynecology clinic for the report she needed and with a sorrowful expression on her face, handed it to her husband. What is this? John asked. I do not understand anything in these medical terms. Explain in Russian what it says here. It says here that I can never be a mother again. You see, I won't be able to get pregnant again. That can't be, the man exclaimed. What kind of diagnosis do you have? Everything can be cured nowadays if you pay well. If necessary, you will be treated abroad. It's not curable, it's not curable, Diana shouted, trying to cry. The woman pretended to be hysterical. What do you think? I didn't recognize it. What do you think it's like for me to get a diagnosis like that? I wanted a baby so badly. What's gonna happen now? You're gonna leave me? Diana pretended to shake with sobs, covering her face with the palms of her hands, her eyes completely dry. Through the slits in her fingers, she watched her confused husband's reaction. Diana, really? Why would I leave you because you're sick? Don't be silly, but uh, maybe we could try. No, no, Diane shrieked. I've been assured there's no cure. John hugged his wife reassuringly, deciding to return to this conversation a little later when she had calmed down. He had no reason not to believe Diana, though. Well, what kind of woman would attribute infertility to herself in the middle of nowhere? 
Diana was, in principle, satisfied with the result of her performance. And when, after a while, John tried to return to this conversation again, again through a tantrum, and that's how she made her husband forget about the second child. And yet, Diana was sure that her husband would never leave her because he loved his only daughter too much. So let him be content with her. And Diana herself has other worries. Her personal life. Diana's light flirtation with a fitness trainer recently turned into a relationship, and she plunged into it with her head. Starting this relationship, Diana was shaking a lot. It was the first time she cheated on her husband. Well, on the other hand, what does John want, disappearing all day at work? Diane is young and beautiful, and men are paying attention to her. Diane was freaking out. Once again, her meeting with her new, young boyfriend had fallen through. John asked her to take Alice to the electronics store and pick out a new smartphone for her birthday. Her daughter's birthday was two weeks ago, though. It's just that Alice wasn't happy with the gift. Here the father and succumbed to the persuasion of the girl decided to give her a smartphone. Girls, Diana grinned. The daughter is already quite an adult bidding guys. Diana should know that. It was John who thought her daughter was still young. And Diana felt her daughter was her competition. Of course she did, because her last lover was only a little older than her daughter. And yet he has no idea how old she really is. Before leaving the house, Diana cast a fleeting glance in the mirror. She looks great. How could one guess her real age here? What a young beauty she is. Diane hurried on seeing that her daughter was already waiting for her in the car with John's driver. That asshole could go off on her own. Although where can she go without money? Mom said Alice when the woman got into the car, maybe I'll drive myself. I know you have no desire to ride with me. Give me the money, I'll grab my friend and we'll pick out a smartphone with her. The girl squinted slyly. No way, sighed Diana. Dad said to go together, so let's go. In the store, Alice went straight to the most expensive gadgets. We should think. Hum, Diana, we do not consider the cheap ones. This one poked her daughter's finger at the latest model of iPhone. Mom, buy this one, but make sure it's gold colored. Young man, Diana called the sales consultant, please come over. Calling the guy Diana thought to just give him instructions to make a purchase, but when he came closer and the woman saw him, decided to do something else. We want to buy this smartphone. Tell us about its features. The guy spoke and Diana admired how young and handsome he was. No, really very handsome. Wavy black hair arranged in a fashionable hairstyle, and the eyes. You only see eyes like that in the movies. They seem to radiate light. Diana used all her tricks and flirted with the salesman, not noticing that her own daughter also keeps her eyes on this guy. The guy, on the other hand, only noticed the girl. He was inexperienced in the games of adult women and saw the girl's admiring gaze at once. Oh, you explain everything so well. It's rare to find such competent salesmen. I'll probably become your regular customer, cooed Diana, when the guy made the purchase. We are always happy to see you in our store, smiled the salesman on duty. Walking from the hip, Diana moved to the exit of the store. A disheveled Alice walked beside her. Near the door, she turned around to see the guy she liked once again. Her cheeks flushed when she saw that the salesman was also looking at her. Michael. Alice whispered the name she read on the guy's name day. I'll come here again, Michael. Mother and daughter reached the house in silence, but when they got out of the car, away from the driver's ears, Diana seemed to realize, oh daughter, and we forgot to buy you accessories for your phone. Headphones, a case for your new smartphone. All right, I'll go back to the store tomorrow and get it for you. What color case do you want? Don't mom, Alice got angry. You don't have to go anywhere. I'll buy the cover myself. Will you stop fluffing up your old feathers in front of young boys? How are you talking to me? Diana shrieked. What do you mean, old feathers? Where do you see an old lady? Come on, mom. You're not 18 years old anymore, and you're still looking at young guys. It's only dad who doesn't notice anything. Of course, in front of him, you behave differently, and I'm already ashamed to bring my friends into the house. As soon as a less handsome guy walks in, you start parading around. You think I don't know where you go when your dad's at work and how reverently you keep your phone close to you at all times. Stop talking nonsense, Diana shouted. And where do you stick your nose anyway? 
Are you trying to tell me what to do with the chicken's eggs? I don't want to hear any more talk like that. You won't if you don't go to today's store to wag your tail in front of the salesman. But if you continue to push him around, I'll tell daddy. Or I'll have him catch you in the act. I hate that you're lying to him. But I'm used to keeping quiet. I've been used to it since I was a kid. I don't think you deserve daddy. I just don't want to disturb his peace of mind. I don't want to worry him. Alice shook a little. The first time in her life, she allowed herself to talk to her mother like that, although she had long been seething with indignation, seeing her mother's constant cheating. The girl did not listen to Diana's angry answer, but turned around and jumped out into the yard. She took out her cell phone and dialed her friend Alfia. She had recently turned 18 and her parents had given her a brand new car for her birthday. Alfia, hi, are you busy right now? Could you take me somewhere? An hour later, the girls were sitting in the car and looking carefully at the huge glass doors of the electronics store where Alice had recently bought her smartphone. It's still half an hour before the store closes. Alfia grumbled unhappily, looking at the time on the dashboard. What are we going to sit here for so long? Let's go in and look at your handsome boy. No, Alice was afraid. I've only been here recently. He'll know I'm on purpose. Of course he will. But isn't that what you want if you like him so much? How are you going to get to know him? Also, you forgot something. Is it okay that you're dating Oliver? You think he'd be so cool with you telling him you like someone else? Oliver's a complicated guy, and I don't think he'd tolerate that. Why do I have to think about Oliver right now? Who says I'm gonna make it with this guy? Maybe he has a girlfriend. Well, judging by your burning eyes, you'd move any girl. Althea smirked. Half an hour later the store employees began to disperse to their homes. In the crowd, Alice almost missed a tall guy who went out in the company of girls' employees of the store. There he is there, Alice shouted sharply, pointing her finger at the windshield. Start the car, Alfia. Let's go after him. Why are we going to chase him? My friend was surprised. Okay, as you say, it's not difficult for me. I can't see him now, of course, but by all appearances, the guy is in demand among the female sex. Look at all those girls chasing him. He walked with his colleagues only to the corner and then saying goodbye, ran to the bus stop. The guy didn't notice the car following him. He was thinking about the girl customer he met in the store today. Her mom, of course, is a little strange, but they have the smell of wealth. The kind of smartphone they'd bought would take him several years to save up for. But for them, it must be nothing. Michael sighed. As much as he didn't like the girl, how could a simple salesman like her? Mom, are you home? I'm home, Michael shouted as he entered the apartment. Georgia, who had just returned from her shift, had already prepared a flavorful kerning for her son. My hand, son, she looked out of the kitchen. We'll have dinner now. Mmm, how delicious it smells, squeezed his eyes, sitting down at the table. When do you have time for everything? How many times have I told you, Mom? You are so tired. Come from work and rest. I am able to cook dinner myself. I don't mind. Georgia waved her hand. Come on, tell me how was your day? What's new? I met such a girl today. She bought a phone from me yesterday with her mom. And today she came back to get a case for it. We got to talking. You know, she's so, uh, she's cool, you know? I thought a girl like that would never pay attention to me. But she hinted that she'd like to meet me. Tomorrow's my day off, and I'm gonna see her. And she has such an unusual name, Alice. I just don't know where I'm supposed to take her. She seems to be from a very wealthy family, and what can I offer her? A movie and a coffee shop? Georgia, who at the mention of the girl's name had an unpleasant prickling in her stomach, nevertheless paid no attention to it. I'll tell you what, son, if a girl really likes you, she'll be glad to go to a cafe with you. But I don't trust them those rich ones. Why did they need simple laborers like us? And you should pick an easy girl, but that's up to you. Tell me, how are your studies going? When's the next session? Michael had finished 11 grades well and had a great desire to get a higher education, but Georgia could not afford it. They both realized that. Then the guy made an independent decision. Immediately after school, he got a job as a salesman, and after saving up some money, he enrolled in correspondence school. I will pay for my studies myself, he told his mother. I'll work and study by correspondence, it's no big deal. You're already out of your skin to provide for us. 
Enough already, we will last now. Give up the raid of nurse. Georgia stubbornly refused. The woman felt guilty. All their lives they'd been struggling to make ends meet and no savings and loan. If her son was going to go to college, he wouldn't have anything. She couldn't even pay for his education. The next day, Michael and Alice met in the city. The guy was a little embarrassed, leading the girl to the movies. What else could he offer this spoiled beauty? Alice didn't care. With this guy, she was ready to just walk around the city, holding hands. From one look of his expressive eyes, the girl's head was blown off. For the first time in her life, Alice fell in love like that without a second thought. It seemed that she was ready to follow Michael to the edge of Anna. Relationships were wrapped up rapidly. Alice immediately after school, studying in the 11th grade, through half the city was carried to a familiar store just to see Michael and interchange with him a few words. The first day she went on a date with Michael, Alice gave her current boyfriend Oliver the rune around. Oliver was a 19-year-old major with a cool car and was totally unprepared for this turn of events. To be turned down? How could she? Usually girls chase after him and he dumps them after he's played with them. Oliver's wounded ego was at play. Alice's friend Althea was silent as a partisan and did not want to explain to him the reason for such a sharp break in relations. Then Oliver himself decided to track down his ex-girlfriend. It was not difficult at all. Oliver only had to drive up to the school and there she was Alice, rushing to the bus stop and driving in the opposite direction from her house. When Oliver realized the reason for the breakup was another guy, he was furious. How could Alice dump him for some salesman? The guy was a sucker and Oliver's sneakers alone were worth more than all the clothes on that salesman and probably more than all the things he had. Oliver couldn't let it go, just as Alice had done. He waited until Michael's workday was over, and when he came out of the store, he walked toward him. Hey, you, you, you. Let's go aside. We need to talk. Michael shrugged his shoulders and followed the major to this car. Oliver came to his car, leaned on it, and ostentatiously playing with the keys, looked threateningly into Michael's eyes. You know, Alice? Well, this is my girlfriend. After these words, Michael immediately realized who was in front of him. Alice was telling him about her ex-boyfriend, with whom she had dated not seriously, out of boredom and broke up immediately, barely meeting Michael. Ex-girlfriend, as far as I know, Michael smiled. You two broke up and now she's dating me. She's the one who thinks we broke up, but it's not up to her. I didn't break up with her. In fact, Alice is mad at me, so she's using you to make me jealous. When she cools off, we'll be fine. I don't think so, Michael countered. You don't get it. Oliver began to argue. If I ever see you around Alice again, I'll tear your legs off. Rip it out. Rip it out right now. What's stopping you? I'm telling you right now, I'm not giving up on Alice. You're a tough one, I see, Oliver shouted and looked at his opponent appraisingly. Yeah, he probably lose to this guy in a direct confrontation. Michael was taller and shoulders taller, and judging by his gait, he's no stranger to sports. Oliver's favorite places to hang out were hookah joints and clubs. I warned you, make your conclusions, Oliver said through gritted teeth, retreating to the driver's door. I'm a man of my word. If I see you with Alice again, you'll be sorry, very sorry. But that's if you live. Wow, what threats, Michael laughed. I also repeat, I will not give up Alice. These words the guy said after the departing car, in which sat Oliver, seething with anger. Oliver was used to the fact that everything in life was easy for him, thanks to his father's money, and people, as a rule, always passed him up, seeing expensive clothes and a cool car. But those people are smart, Oliver thought. This one must be a fool. Fools are taught. Let him try not to listen to me. And it wasn't that Oliver needed Alice so much. He had plenty of girls like her, but his wounded ego called for action. After a couple days, Oliver was convinced that the salesman hadn't heeded his words and was still seeing Alice. Oliver sat in his car and watched them walk down the street holding hands. Anger boiled up inside. The guy already knew what he was going to do. Taking his gaze away from the couple annoying him, Oliver called one of his acquaintances. Leshy, hey, I've got a favor to ask you. You've got the contact info for these badass athletes. Yeah, yeah, they're the goon squad that do certain favors for money. 
Set me up with them. I got a good paying assignment for them. What do you care? I just need to teach a sucker a lesson. A good one. Oliver in his car was following Michael down a dark street. Michael had just seen Alice off to her house and had gone back on foot because the buses weren't running because of the late hour. He couldn't even call a cab. Oliver sneered, driving slowly. Oliver waited for Michael to enter the dark alley. In addition to the driver, there were four big, pumped-up guys of gangster appearance in the car. These guys were providing some services for a fee. And Steve went about them as completely badasses. We won't follow him for long, one of the jocks muttered. There's a good spot over there. He's about to make a turn and stop. We'll book him there. But let's talk terms right away. How do we take the guy down? Like cold turkey? No, do the whole thing, Oliver shuddered. Just break his legs, that's all. Well, maybe he could spend the rest of his life in a wheelchair. Deal, said the jock, pulling his balaclava over his face. Keep in mind, if this guy points you out, forget about us. When they take you for one place, you better not even think about us. I can't be taken for this place, Oliver said pathetically. Do you know who my father is? We've heard, the jock muttered through gritted teeth. All right, clients turned stop. Michael walked home happy, thinking about Alice. How'd he like this girl? At first, he thought that Alice is a major, but she turned out to be not spoiled by money and easy to communicate. At least in front of Michael, the girl never boasted of wealth and gladly went with Michael to the movies, walked around the city, visited inexpensive caves. And although Michael clearly felt their social inequality, still in the depths of his soul, he had a hope that they could do something. After all, the young people did not want to part in the evenings. Michael was walking with a slight smile on his lips when out of the darkness a big guy with a bat in his hand stepped toward him. His face was not visible, as it turned out later, not only because of the darkness, he was wearing a balaclava. At first, Michael didn't even get excited, thinking that he was mistaken for someone else. But then a man's voice sounded behind him, which seemed vaguely familiar. Well, we've met, just as I promised. Michael turned sharply to look at the man who was speaking. It was Alice's ex-boyfriend, who had threatened him a few days ago. Don't say I didn't warn you, Oliver grinned. I keep my word. Georgia was working the night shift, and it was business as usual, except that Michael wasn't returning her calls. That made the woman a little worried. Her son didn't call back after a while, as he always did. Georgia calmed herself with the thought that Michael must have fallen asleep after a long day at work. He still managed to go out with his new girlfriend after work. Georgia did not approve of the relationship, having learned that the girl was from a wealthy family. The woman thought that such relationships could not lead to anything good, but let them sort it out themselves. Georgia was especially upset in the morning, although the time was still early, but usually Michael had already gotten up for work. Not only had he never called back, but his phone was unavailable. The woman had barely waited until the end of her shift and was about to run home when she was called from her post. Georgia, can you drop off the case histories at the emergency room on the way? Yeah, sure, Georgia nodded, grabbing the papers. I'll do it, it's no problem. The woman went down in the elevator, and her heart clenched with a bad feeling. Already heading for the exit, she caught herself and rushed to the waiting room. There at that moment, they were carrying a patient from the ambulance on a stretcher. Imagine, a very young guy. They found him when it started to get light. We don't know how long he'd been lying there. He was beaten up, badly beaten. We need to get him to intensive care, the paramedic from the ambulance told the emergency room nurses. Georgia herself didn't know what made her, what force made her, approach the stretcher and look into the face of the beaten boy. Her heart stopped beating, her eyes were covered with a veil. The woman fainted, right in front of the stretcher. What's wrong with her? The paramedic was surprised. That's the nurse from surgery, right? Yeah, that's Georgia. She looked at the guy and collapsed right away. Must be someone she knows. What if it's? Oh my God, she told me she had a son that age. God forbid. Georgia came to her senses on the couch where the nurses had moved her. She remembered everything right away. The guy, the guy they brought in in the ambulance. He's in the ICU, Georgia. Do you know him? Georgia jumped up off the couch and rushed out of the emergency room. It must be her son. I'm not mistaken, the nurse muttered. What a grief. 
Even though Georgia was a nurse, they wouldn't let her in the emergency room, no matter how hard she tried. We're gonna do everything we can to help your son, and you don't need to see him right now, believe me. There's nothing you can do to help him now. Here, take his things for now. The doctor put a bag of clothes in one hand and Michael's cell phone in the other. Georgia accepted it and absently pressed the power button. The phone, beeping merrily, blinked with a lighted screen. The screensaver showed his face pressed against the girl's cheek. There she is, his Alice, Georgia thought. Wow, how much did my son talk about her and he never bothered to show a picture. Then numerous social media messages from this Alice girl Zamordianized on the screen. Michael, where are you? Where are you? Why aren't you answering? Georgia clicked on one of these messages and found herself on the girl's page. What an interesting status she had. My favorite is the best in the world. Did she write that about Michael? Swallowing back tears, Georgia thought. Maybe this girl actually loves him. I'll have to tell her what happened, but later, when my son comes to the senses, and Michael must, must come to the senses. Otherwise, there's no reason for me to go on living. My son is the only thing that makes sense in my life. I've already lost my beloved husband once, but then there was Michael and there was something to live for. The girl Alice apparently saw that Michael was online and sent a bunch of new messages urging him to answer her. Georgia flipped down the screen. Alice's pictures flashed up. There she was at home. Yes, this girl is not a poor girl. Yeah, and here she was, apparently with her parents. Georgia fixed her eyes on the face of Alice's mother. The phone fell out of her hands. The woman slowly slid down the wall, passing out for the second time that day. Diana and her husband were having dinner. It was one of those rare evenings when John came home early and Diane herself had no plans. The couple ate in silence. It had been a long time since they'd had a common topic of conversation. Diana didn't want to know how her husband was doing at work, and he wasn't interested in how his wife spent her time. Their only common topic was their daughter. After a long silence, John asked Michael a question. Where are we with Alice? I don't see her that much lately. Where is she? How should I know? The wife shrugged her shoulders. She doesn't report to me. Probably out with her boyfriend. What boyfriend, Oliver? You're out of touch with life, Diana snorted. Our daughter broke up with Oliver. She's got another friend of her heart now. She hasn't brought him home, and something's gone wrong there, judging by how nervous Alice has been the last few days. How is it, Diane? You stay at home and you don't talk to your daughter at all. No matter where you ask, you never know where she is. I realize she's a big girl, but not so big that you can't control her. Does she let herself be controlled? Diana exclaimed indignantly. Tonka is like a prickly hedgehog, snapping at you when you ask her anything. She only snaps at you. And that's what I don't understand, because you're her mother. You're supposed to be close, but you're the opposite. John did not have time to finish, as a disheveled Alice burst into the dining room and began to shout at her mother. Mom, what happened on the river 15 years ago? Tell me now. Alice, are you out of your mind? John frowned. Why do you let yourself yell at your mother? And what's the matter with you anyway? What's that look? Did you get into a fight with someone? John noticed a bright red scratch on his daughter's cheek. I wasn't in a fight, Dad. A complete stranger tried to beat me up. Alice plopped down on a chair and grabbed a glass of water from the table and began to drink greedily. Frowning John looked at his daughter and waited for her to get drunk and explain to him what was going on. I'll tell you everything first, Dad, said the girl seeing her father's tense look. I'm seeing a guy right now. His name is Michael. He's nice, very nice. He's a part-time graduate student, and he's working so he can help his mother. She raised him alone. Michael always spoke only warmly of his mother. I love Michael, Dad, I really do. It's not just a childhood crush anymore. Three days ago, he disappeared. Stop contacting me. I couldn't breathe at the thought that he might have left me. I really couldn't breathe without him. Every day I went to the store where he works, but the employees didn't know anything. Michael just disappeared, never showed up for work. And just today, one of the clerks found out what really happened to Michael. He was beaten up on the street and he's still in intensive care. I found out what hospital he was in and I ran straight there. And his mom was there, 
Dad, you have no idea what happened. She attacked me in the hospital hallway. At first, I thought the woman was crazy. She wanted to scratch my eyes out. I couldn't understand how a person who didn't know me could lash out at me with such hatred. But she didn't do it silently, she screamed. Screaming that I was the curse of her life, that 15 years ago she lost her beloved husband, his father, because of me. And now Michael had been beaten up, again because of me. When the nurses pulled this woman away from me, I started screaming too. I yelled at her, you're crazy, I've never met you before. Why do you think Michael was beaten because of me? And what does your husband have to do with it? Ask your mother. Let her tell you how 15 years ago my husband gave his life for someone else's child on the river. For you. Your mother was too drunk and partying to watch her own daughter. Michael's mom told me to get out of the hospital and never dare go near her son again. And I love Michael and I'm not going to listen to her. I don't know how badly he was beaten, but if he dies, I die with him. Now I ask you, Mom, so what happened on that river 15 years ago, and why does that woman hate me so much? Diana sat there, neither dead nor alive. She straightened in her chair like a taut string, and the woman's eyes darted from her husband to her daughter. Diana realized what she had feared for so long had happened, and then she relaxed. Time had passed, all was forgotten. That's what Diana thought. And it turned out that's how the truth came out. The woman rolled with a nervous laugh. I don't know what you're talking about, Alice. This is really crazy. I don't think so, said a pale John. For some reason, I remembered the story on the river very well. A man drowned there, saving someone else's child. Why do I remember it? Because at the time, I thought a lot about that man's selflessness. I even gave his widow money as financial aid through other people. But what makes her think it's you, Alice? She's deluded. Maybe you look like that girl. Maybe someone put it in her head. Okay. John got up from the table abruptly. Now you and I are gonna go with her, and we're gonna get to the bottom of this. Yes, yes, let's go, Daddy. Alice nodded often. Tell that crazy woman that she is wrong, and I want to see Michael. I want to know what's wrong with him. You don't have to go anywhere. Diana shrieked. You've already realized that this woman is not in her right mind. Apparently, she's a disturbed woman. Diana faltered at the suspiciously angry look her husband gave her and realized that the seed of doubt had already been planted in him. Georgia was sitting on the couch in the nurse's lounge, drinking valerian. Georgia, what are you doing? A nurse she knew said with horror. Why are you so hard on that girl? I thought you were going to tear her hair out. Is this really the girl who drowned your Steve? Well, even if it was, it wasn't the girl's fault. Guilty as charged, exhaled Georgia, who had become a little sluggish under the sedatives. My son was beaten up because of that girl. I lost my husband because of her. I hate her and her mother. I hate them so much. Why, why did they come into our lives and become a curse on our family? An orderly came barreling into the nurse's room and looked at Georgia warily and said, Georgia, there's this. A man's here with the girl you've been roughing up. Apparently, it's her father, and he insists on talking to you. They weren't allowed into the station, of course. They're waiting for you downstairs in the visiting room. Let me tell them you're sick and can't come out. This guy's very solid. Probably wants to confront you for beating up his daughter. What? You think I'm afraid of them? Georgia jumped up. After what's happened to me in this life, I'm not afraid of anything or anyone. The worst has already happened. But Michael is still alive, said the nurse timidly. Yes, my son is alive. And to keep him alive, I must keep him away from this family. Georgia jumped up from the couch and ran past the nurse and the frightened nurse. Don't let anything happen again, the nurse muttered. What if there's a fight? Georgia's probably not in her right mind. I've been working with Georgia for years, and I'll never forget what happened to her when her husband drowned. Then she was all about Michael, living for her son, and here she is again. And it's all because of this family. It's like a fate, really. Jonah and Alice. Georgia came down, seemingly calm. They had no way of knowing it was the sedatives they'd given her in the nurse's station. The drugs had given Georgia a certain lethargy, but her gaze still flashed with rage when she saw Alice sitting on a bench next to a stout man. John intercepted that look and jumped up from his seat blocking his daughter. Your name is Georgia, and you beat my daughter. I'm not going to return the favor. 
I think you were acting in a state of shock. I take it this is all about a story from 15 years ago on the river. Only tell me, what makes you think Alice is the girl who drowned? You're deluded. Am I mistaken? Laughed Georgia bitterly. Do you really think that I saw a resemblance to that child in Alice and threw myself at her because of that? I didn't. I just recognized who her mother was. You're dying I'll remember for the rest of my life. What are you doing here, messing with me? You can't be ignorant of that story. I heard of that story and I admire your husband, but I never imagined it would happen to my girl. If you're right, my wife hid everything from me. Tell me exactly what happened. What happened? Your dying got drunk with a friend and two guys and didn't watch your daughter. The girl fell off a cliff. Steve and I were on our way home when panic set in. My husband jumped in after your baby. He knew. He knew about the vortex, and he warned me repeatedly not to go near it. Steve knowingly sacrificed himself for a chance to save someone else's daughter. Then I came to your house to ask for money for the funeral, alone, but your wife treated me like a beggar reprimanded me and said that no one asked my husband to jump. It was his own fault. She couldn't have said that. John shrieked. Diana is far from perfect, but she's not that cynical. I see you don't know who you're living with, and you don't know what goes on in your own home. How can you not know that your child almost drowned? You're a bad family. You're a rotten family. Steve and I had a real one. We loved each other, and after he died, life became a struggle to survive. Your daughter's living the good life. She's a beautiful, spoiled brat. But my son is in intensive care because of her. I don't know if he's going to make it. What do you mean you don't know? Michael could die. Alice cried from behind her father's back. And why me? Why are you blaming me for everything? Because your ex-boyfriend beat up Michael with the help of some thugs. His name is Oliver. Michael regained consciousness and told the coroner everything. Oliver? Oliver did it? Are you sure? John was surprised. I know his father well. A lot of people know his father, believe me. And the investigator's eyes glazed over when he heard that name. It's already clear that Oliver won't be held accountable for anything. He will. John said imperiously, looking intently into George's eyes. If he's guilty, he will. I give you my word. His father is a powerful man, of course, but I'm not the last man in this town. I'll do my best, but Oliver will be held accountable, and someone else will, and we'll see you again. John said the last words as he walked toward the door, dragging his daughter by the hand. Alice was crying. Why, why did you say that Michael might not survive? She looked back at Georgia. That was all the girl cared about at that moment. Diana sat in the living room, all tense and ready for the upcoming conversation. It seemed to her that she was ready. Well, after all, it had been so many years. She was young and foolish. John must discount that. As her husband whirled into the house and opened his mouth, ready to unleash the full force of his anger on his wife's head, she prevented him from doing so by speaking first. I get it, you found out. You are aware that it was Alice, that she was the one who drowned in the river. So, yes, I made a mistake going to the river, but that was a long time ago. I would have told you back then. But do you remember how you acted? How do you blame that negligent mother you said you had, not knowing it was me? And I was right. John roared, I still think so. Neglectful, you put it mildly. I think much worse of you. You've never been a normal mother. And I've put up with you all my life for my daughter's sake. And now it turns out our daughter might not be alive if it weren't for a stranger, and all because of you. What are you talking about? Diane is boiling. He tolerates me, and I don't? Or do you think life with you is easy? You're never home. How many times have we been away together? I can count on my fingers. You think that's life? Well, as far as I'm concerned, you're living life to the fullest. Or do you really think I don't know about your young lovers? I just didn't care. I don't care about you, Diane. About you or how you spend your time. As long as you don't bother me. I didn't divorce you so I wouldn't traumatize my daughter. Then there's that damn disease, your infertility. I'd be a bastard to divorce you, leaving a sick wife. So I put up with it. I haven't felt anything for you for a long time, and I don't care if you're going out. But now that I know you almost killed a child, lying to me and shitting on the soul of Steve's widow who turned to you. You're such an asshole, Diane. I don't want to see you another day. 
you realize this is the end of our married life together. Diane was furious, realizing that nothing could be done now, and John would divorce her anyway. She wanted to hurt him too. So be it. Go ahead and divorce him. I'll tell you what, you're not only a horny deer, you're a dumbass. You say you live with me because I'm infertile. I'm not infertile. I didn't want to have a baby. I didn't want to nurse those little smotty babies. And I didn't care that you wanted a son. So you had to settle for just a daughter. John squinted angrily at his wife and unexpectedly for her laughed. Do you think you've trampled me now? Don't get your hopes up. Yes, I felt sorry for you and believed you. So I did not leave you. But I wasn't gonna give up my kids because of you. I've got a second family with two kids growing up. The oldest is 10 years old. And now I won't even wait for an official divorce from you. I'll bring them here as soon as you leave the house. And you'll be out of the house fast. And I'll talk to Alice. I don't think she'll want to go with you. You're such a bad mother. Your daughter will never support you. Diane was trying to play nice. And get a divorce. I've been wanting to do that for a long time. I won't be alone either. And in the divorce, I'll take half of everything you own. It's not gonna work, Diane. You're gonna walk away with your ass naked. You think because you've been cheating on me for so long, I haven't taken care of it. You sign the papers without realizing it, and you get nothing in the divorce. That can't be. Diana shrieked. You bastard. I didn't sign anything. And if you did, I'll hire a lawyer to prove that you did it all by deception. What are you gonna hire a lawyer for, Diane? It takes good money to hire a good lawyer. Now who has more money, you or me? You know, when I slicked you those papers to sign, I wasn't really planning on using them, just in case. And now I realize you're being punished. It's a little punishment for being such a scumbag. Oliver was rocking out in the club to the rhythmic sounds of loud music when two men in civilian clothes approached him, quickly waving a crust in front of the guy's face. One of them threw, you're under arrest. Oliver was a little stoned and he found himself laughing eerily. I'm in custody. Do you even know who you're talking to? Do you know who my father is? We know, we know, muttered one of the cops, roughly pushing Mitri into the duty car. We know everything, all questions to the superiors. It was necessary to see the confusion on Oliver's face when he realized that what was happening was not a joke, not a prank of friends, and he was really being taken to the station, knowing who his father was. The next morning, a confused secretary came into John's office John, there's a man here to see you. I told him you were busy. Get out of the way, rudely pushed the girl away, a full balding man in an expensive suit, bursting into the office. Hello, John, I'll get right to the point. My son was arrested yesterday. Can you believe it? Oliver was arrested right in the club. I know, John replied, making no attempt to stand up and offered his hand to his old acquaintance. You know it, don't you? The man frowned. And I thought it wasn't true when I was told that this arrest had its roots in you. It's true, Archie. Your son brutalized a guy and he's gonna be held accountable for it. Who said that? The big man got all worked up. Who's the boy? It was just a fight over a girl. Your daughter, by the way. But that guy's nobody and his name's nobody. I don't get it, John. Do you have a personal grudge against me? No, it's nothing personal. It's just that the guy's not a stranger to me. Consider it that. Who is he to you? Archie's confused. Is he so close to you that you're going to fight with me over him? Very close. I'm ready to fight if I have to. John got up from the table. You know, it's just that whoever has the most money is right. In this case, you lose. I'm not doing anything illegal, and your son will be held fully accountable for what he did. And he's going down. You want to fight me, Archie? Believe me. I'll go all the way. Sweat beaded on the big man's bald head. He'd known John for years and knew that when he said he'd go all the way, he'd go all the way. Archie knew the man's stubbornness firsthand, and Archie knew John's capabilities too. John, come on really. We've known each other for years too. What's he gonna do? Go to jail. It's not that big a deal. Maybe he'll get off on probation. He won't, John said meaningfully. It'll be what the court says it will be by the law at this time. Oliver's not your only son, is he? What would it be like for the other two if dad went bankrupt? Even so, Archie squinted at him. Even so, John cut him off. At the same time in the hospital, under the door of the intensive care unit, 
Georgia was sobbing. The doctor had recently told her the terrible news. Michael's kidneys were failing. He needs a transplant. Of course, he will be put on a waiting list for a donor organ. But Georgia has worked in medicine for too long and knew perfectly well what the chance of waiting for that waiting list is. Mine, take mine, Georgia shouted without hesitation. The doctor nodded, as if knowing her mother's reaction in advance. Yes, it is possible in principle. Let's go through the necessary examination, and we will make sure that your organ is suitable for transplantation. And so, a few minutes ago, the doctor said that her kidney is not suitable. As she wept, Georgia tried to pull herself together, stop crying, and find a solution. Something had to be done. Michael could go on for hours. She of all people should know that. The woman straightened up, wiped her tear-stained eyes, and only then saw Alice peeking out from around the corner leading to the emergency room. Brave fool, thought the woman. Have you come again? Did I not clearly tell you not to show your face here anymore? Kill me. Alice took a step out of the corner. Kill me. Pull out all my hair. I'll still come here. I've been standing here a long time and I heard you talking to the doctor. Michael needs a kidney transplant and yours isn't a match. Take mine. I'm ready. Georgia looked carefully at the excited, covered with red spots girl. Dummy, do you realize what you're proposing? It's not an easy surgery. Anything can happen when you take a donor organ. You could die. But even if everything goes well, you'll only have one kidney and that's not a full life. Do you realize that? I'm not as stupid as you think I am. I understand the risks. Even if I die, I'm okay with it. No, that's not the right word. I don't agree, I insist. I would rip a kidney out of myself just to keep Michael alive. When I think he might be gone, I don't want to live. Georgia looked at Alice thoughtfully, as if seeing her for the first time. You stupid girl, you don't understand anything yet. You're a minor and you don't have the right to decide such things. Maybe, I admit, you really love my son, but I can't do anything about my dislike for you. Alice flew out of the hospital like scalded and threw herself on the roadway, blocking the way of a yellow car with a checkered flag. The cab driver braked sharply, almost touching the girl standing on the road with his bumper. He jumped out and attacked her, almost with fists. What are you doing, you crazy girl? You're sick of living. Go throw yourself off the bridge. What do I have to do with it? Alice didn't listen to him. She ran to the passenger door, opened it, and got into the car. I need you to take me downtown now. I'm not getting out of the car. Take me. I have to go to my father's office. The cab driver was already eyeing the unstable passenger with apprehension. Either she was crazy or this girl had something happen and it was serious. The man silently got behind the wheel and turned the car around. John's secretary had only recently come to her senses after a visit from a man who had roughly pushed her and then Alice burst in and raced to the door of her father's office. Your daddy doesn't have time. He has a meeting. The secretary shouted at her back. Alice flew into the office and not paying attention to several respectable men sitting at a long table shouted. Daddy, you have to authorize me to donate a kidney to Michael. Well, John said angrily. I didn't raise you well, daughter. Don't you notice anything around you? You don't see people sitting around and you barge in. Go out to the waiting room and wait there. No, dad. This case can't wait. Michael could die. Okay, got it, Dad sighed heavily. He turned to his staff. Would you mind leaving us? The meeting is adjourned. Sorry, family matters. The men rose at the same time and looking disapprovingly at the chief's ill-mannered daughter, left the office. I'm listening to you carefully, Alice. What happened there? I was at the hospital. Michael's kidneys are failing. He needs an emergency transplant. His mom's kidney isn't a match. He has to wait in line and he might not get it, you know? I'm young, I'm healthy, I can easily live with one kidney. But I'm a minor, you have to sign the authorization. That's out of the question. John cut him off. Alice screamed. She screamed and screamed, not noticing that her father was sitting with his hand on his head, not paying any attention to his daughter, thinking carefully about something. Shut up, Alice, he finally said, raising his head at Alice. I already told you. You won't be Michael's donor, I will be. If my kidney is a match, of course. But somehow I think it will. It has to be. Michael's father gave his life for you. 
and I'm only giving a kidney for his son's life. Diane stalked her daughter outside the school. It's not the first time a woman's done that. And it wasn't because she missed Alice. She needed the money. Of course, Diana left her husband's house not completely empty-handed, and she had money and jewelry in sufficient quantity. But she had moved in with a young and voracious lover. Voracious not in terms of food, but in terms of needs. Having got in touch with Diana, the guy was used to living large and was not going to moderate his appetites. Moreover, now Diana lives on his territory, although he did not ask her to do so. Diana's money ran out lightning fast and the young friend began to hint that he was not going to provide for a grown-up aunt, and they had no obligations, they met only for pleasure. Diana felt humiliated, but she had nowhere to go, so she turned to her daughter for the first time. Alice, quite predictably, decided to stay with her father. Alice had money, her father was never stingy when it came to his favorite daughter, and she had given it to her mother several times, but the money was running out fast. Alice, hello, Diana waved her hand from the ajar window of the car, John had generously allowed her to take. I missed you, come on, get in the car. Alice sighed sadly and separated from the flock of girlfriends with whom she came down from the school porch. The girl walked towards her mother's car. I don't have any money, was the first phrase of the girl when she sat down next to Diana. What? No money right away? Her mother pouted. Can't I just visit my daughter? I said I missed her. Don't lie to me, Mom. You never miss me. In fact, you didn't need me. I realize that now. You came for money, and I don't have any. Why not? Diane raised her eyebrows. What did your daddy turn his attention to his new kids? And you don't get anything from him. That's not the point, Mom. Whether I get money from my father or not is none of your business. I don't have any more money for you. I know you didn't leave home empty-handed, and I know who you've blown it on. Don't come to see me again. Look, what arrogance. Diana curled her lips, and this is my daughter talking to me. Your father, too, such a hero, gave his kidney to some guy. The whole town's talking about it. It's all over the social media. Obviously, it's a PR stunt. After that, he's probably making a lot of money, but that he kicked his wife out of the house and brought in a second family, the story doesn't tell. How do you like living with your new family? How do you like your brothers? They're normal brothers, Alice said, and their mom is normal, even though she looks like a model, but she's homely, running around, looking at daddy's mouth. Maybe he originally needed such a one, Maybe your marriage was a mistake, and maybe I shouldn't have been born. Then Michael would have a father, and I'm nothing but trouble. If Diana had been an attentive mother, she would have noticed that her daughter was depressed, but she didn't care about Alice. She was frantically thinking about how to go on living, and on what? Without money, her lover would obviously kick her out. He had made that clear. Alice didn't care about her mother's worries either. With a loud slam of the car door, she jumped out and ran to catch up with her friends. She didn't want to go home. It was true that her father had a new family, and not that Alice had anything against them. She understood everything, because she was a grown-up girl, but it just became unusual in the house. Alice felt superfluous, and maybe not even in the house, maybe in this life. And everything seemed to be fine. Not so long ago, Alice was so happy when the kidney transplant operation on Michael was successful, and it became clear that the guy will live. John, who had donated his organ, was also feeling fine. He had already been discharged from the hospital. And with Michael, everything was more complicated. He was still lying, but, as the doctor said, was on the mend. And Alice found out through her father. Georgia did not let Alice near her son and forbade the girl to go near the hospital. I am grateful to your father, but together with Michael, you cannot be, said Georgia. You bring only unhappiness. And Alice believed in these words. The girl actually began to feel that way. She sank into a severe depression. She didn't want to do anything at all, neither to go home, nor to go out with her friends. Why nothing though? She wanted to be with Michael, but that was impossible. John was working in his office. Doctors, after discharge, strongly advised bed rest, but the man felt normal for a long time. He tried not to go to the office yet. He did things from home. The man did what he promised Diane he would do. Right after he kicked her out of the house, he brought his second family here, having talked to Alice beforehand. 
the boys were happy and Kendall, their mom, was blowing John away. She never entered his office without knocking, afraid to disturb him while he was working. So now, there was a scraping at the massive door, and Kendall's head appeared. John, Alice's friend is here to see you. She wants to talk to you. Would you like to come out to the living room, or should I bring her in here? Send her in here. There's probably boys walking around on their heads in the living room. That's just the way it is, Kendall smiled. A couple minutes later, Alice's close friend, Alfia, entered Joma's office. Hello, she said with embarrassment. Alice doesn't know about my visit to you, and you don't tell her or she'll be offended. I'm worried about her. What's wrong, Alfia? I can see Alice is sad, but it's because of Michael. His mom won't let them see each other anymore. Alice will get sad and forget him. Sad. Forgetful? exclaimed Alfia. I wouldn't call it that. Do you know that your daughter climbs to the roof of an unfinished high-rise and stares down for hours? What do you think she's thinking at that moment? I'm really scared for Alice. She's got it in her head that she's bringing misfortune to others. And she doesn't want to live without Michael. At first I thought it was just a crush and she'd forget him, but you know, it's not. Alice loves this guy, really loves him. We have to do something. I'm afraid for Alice. After the girl said that, John was worried. He didn't realize his daughter's feelings for Michael were so serious. Georgia took her son's things out of the hospital bedside table and put them neatly into bags. Finally, we're coming home with you, son. I made you some pies with cabbage, just the way you like them, the woman chattered on. Michael was gloomy and his mother knew why. Alice. From the very beginning, as soon as the boy came to the senses, Georgia had told him she wouldn't let him date Alice and told him why. You want me dead, go ahead. He's seen this girl, step over your mother. These were the words with which the woman ended her speech. She was not affected even by the fact that John donated his kidney to Michael and the fact that the man opened a large money account in the name of her son. The money, by the way, the woman refused for a long time and was about to give it back to John. That's when their first serious conversation happened. This is a small part of what I have to do for you. Steve gave his life, and I just gave a kidney. Of course, money won't bring your husband and father back to you, but Georgia, think about it. Wouldn't Steve have made that money if he were alive? And whose fault is he not? That's just it. I want Michael to get a college degree full-time and not work like he does now. And you, stop scrubbing floors in your hospital. It's time for a vacation. Michael will graduate, and if he has the brains, start his own business. He'll have some startup capital. Let me do at least that for you. Georgia thought, thought long and hard, then she got it out. Okay, we'll take the money. Let Michael have a chance at a normal future, not like mine. But you know I'm not gonna let him see Alice anyway. That's your right, John shrugged, taking youthful relationships lightly. Georgia and her son walked out of the hospital gates and Michael breathed in the fresh air he had missed in the hospital room. At that time, a huge SUV pulled up beside them. John jumped out of the car and grabbed the bags from George's hands. Get in the car and I'll give you a ride, he said. We'll take the bus, Georgia stubbornly argued. The man, not listening to the objections, literally pushed them into his car. A little way from the hospital, he turned into the first parking lot he could find. He turned off the engine and half turned around to look at Michael in the back seat. So, Michael, how do you feel about my daughter? I love her, he answered without a second thought. I see, John stretched out. Then why did you put up with your mom's band? Michael hesitated, then lowering his eyes mumbled. I didn't. What? Georgia shrieked from the front seat. She too, turned to look at her son. What do you mean you haven't gotten over it? Michael, what are you talking about? Mom, look, all I can think about all the time is Alice. I understand and I don't want to upset you but I can't stop thinking about her. I was going to see Alice to talk to her. If she's okay with our breakup, then well. She hasn't, John shouted. She's very much not okay with it, so much so that she's thinking of jumping off the roof. And I got that from a friend of hers. Georgia, you're a reasonable adult. What are you doing? Let the young people decide their own fate. They're not to blame for our sins. The more we interfere with them now, the more they'll be drawn to each other. 
They'll run away if it's not their destiny, but we shouldn't decide that for them. If my daughter jumps off the roof, what then? Your Steve will have died for nothing, giving his life for her. Georgia, wake up. Georgia was almost crying. Why are you making a monster out of me? I reconsidered my attitude toward Alice when she wanted to give her kidney, but I'm afraid. I have a crazy fear. Michael put his hand on his mother's shoulder and smiled. Don't be afraid, Ma. Everything is definitely going to be okay now. All the skeletons are out of the closets and only happiness lies ahead. A week later, two young people came to the cemetery, a guy and a girl. The girl had a huge bouquet of scarlet roses in her hands. Here he is, my dad, said the guy, stopping near one of the graves. A young man with an open, friendly face looked at the girl from the monument. Thank you, whispered Alice, placing the flowers on the grave. Thank you for my life and for Michael.